This video is sponsored by NordVPN. It goes without saying that one very real spooky scenario we have to worry about a lot these days is having our information stolen online, which can happen at pretty much any time if you're not careful. Take for example when you're out and about. You might log on to free Wi-Fi you think you recognize when in reality it's a fake set up by sketchy individuals who are banking on you not thinking twice about it. Having a VPN handy will keep you safe, since even if this does happen, all the scammer would see on their end is encrypted gibberish instead of your sensitive info. This, of course, is just one feature of NordVPN, but on top of that, they've got a number of others, such as threat protection, which can be used even when you're not connected to VPN, to help keep you protected against things like malware, trackers, and malicious ads and downloads. Now, security, of course, should never be neglected, but in case you're looking for something more, NordVPN also allows you access to a bunch of geoblocked content. Just set your location to whatever country you like, and you'll be able to browse titles unavailable in your local region. If you're looking to have some safe, protected fun online, then head on over to nordvpn.com slash rainbot to get a two-year plan at a huge discount, as well as four additional months absolutely free. Unsatisfied? Then just take advantage of NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee. Again, that's nordvpn.com slash rainbot. For children in care systems around the world, adoption is basically the dream. When it goes right, getting adopted offers stability where there once was none, and grants a child a home life comparable to any other kid their age. Now, when adults have bad intentions and safeguards fail, however, things can go horribly wrong very quickly. This was unfortunately the case for Jung In, a baby not yet old enough to speak, whose story would shake the entire nation of South Korea. Because of local laws, Jung-in's adoptive parents have only been publicly identified by their last names, that being Jung, the mother, and An, the father. On the face of it, the couple appeared to be the ideal adoptive parents. They already had a four-year-old biological daughter and, according to their friends, had been passionate about adopting a child even before their first had arrived. They seemed to be so suited for the task, in fact, that the two of them were even featured in a Korea educational broadcast system documentary called an Ordinary Family, a film intended to actually promote adoption. In spite of outward appearances, however, it did not take long for jung -un's new life to become nothing short of a complete nightmare. In the investigation that was to come, police would conclude that her abuse began in February, just one month after her adoption. This went unnoticed, or at least unreported, until several months later. On May 25th of 2020, a worker at the little girl's daycare would be the first to sound the alarm. They reported suspected abuse to the authorities after finding bruises on the baby's stomach and thighs. What was their excuse for all this? Well, jung -in apparently had a condition that caused her legs to be slightly deformed, and the adoptive parents claimed that the bruises had probably come as the result of massages that were meant to correct this condition. That, of course, does not cover the bruises not located on her legs, but nonetheless, nothing significant came from this development. The next warning sign came not long after, on June 29th, when it was reported to police that jung -in had been left alone inside a parked car. Keep in mind, this is during the summer. In the end, the authorities would fail to find any evidence of neglect, though that's hardly surprising given that, according to the Granite Tower, the police didn't even begin investigating this until around a month after the report, and by that point, things, of course, had fizzled out. Now, in July, jung -in had stopped attending daycare and wouldn't return for a full two months. Though the workers had already shown concern about her welfare due to the aforementioned bruises, they did feel that, independent of this, she appeared to be a happy and healthy child overall. Staff reported that following her absence, the baby would now frequently have bruises, that her complexion had changed, and that she was very clearly underweight. Text messages between her adoptive parents recovered later in the investigation would expose the fact that the choice to starve her was not only deliberate, but malicious. By September 23rd, someone at the daycare felt so troubled by everything that was going on that they decided to take the situation into their own hands by bringing jung -in to a hospital. The doctor who examined her recognized the red flags, thankfully, and filed a report of suspected child abuse in which they strongly advised that the girl be removed from her parents. 
In response to this, the police requested that the couple submit a more extensive examination of the child. Zhang and An would of course fulfill this request, but by getting the results of this examination from a doctor they already knew. Said doctor would conclude that the injuries he witnessed were the result of stomatitis. Now, stomatitis means an inflammation or sores of the mouth, which obviously does not account for much of what was wrong with Zhang In, but does lend credence to the unconfirmed rumors that the child was deliberately fed things that were too hot to be consumed. The second doctor, whose exact personal relationship with the abusive pair is unclear, would later go on to say that he was unaware of the abuse allegations when he had seen the girl as a patient. This defense, of course, does little because all it proves is that he's either a liar or very awful at his job. Now, despite all this, based on his questionable report, the authorities would once again disregard the obvious signs of mistreatment, and by October 12th of 2020, things were looking especially dire. Once again, it was the people at the daycare pushing for something to be done. As a staff member pleaded with the adoptive parents to take Jung into a doctor, having noticed that she could no longer swallow or drink. This caregiver would go on to say, quote, The day before she died, Jung In looked like she gave up on everything. She didn't eat any of her favorite snacks, nor played with her favorite toys. On October 13th, the following day, Jung In's condition became critical. Her mother took a taxi, presumably to the hospital, and actually had to be persuaded by the cab driver to call an ambulance instead. Once there, the infant would suffer three cardiac arrests in the care of medical professionals, who were unfortunately, ultimately, unable to save her. Jungin's life came to an end a mere 271 days after being adopted. Examination on her body would reveal several fractured bones and multiple head wounds. Because of these discoveries, someone working at the hospital would, again, report suspected abuse. According to Korea Jungang Daily, quote, an autopsy by the National Forensic Service found that Jungin died of serious internal bleeding of her organs caused by external force. Now, the type of organ trauma she suffered is almost never seen in cases of accidental injury. The autopsy also revealed evidence of, quote, at least 10 past fractures, which made it clear that the little one had been assaulted repeatedly and over an extended period of time. Also extremely troubling was the child's weight, which was only 8 kilograms at the time of her death. A kilogram less than her weight when she was adopted, in spite of her now being 9 months older. Finally, in November of 2020, the Seoul District Prosecutor's Office proceeded in indicting both parents, Zhang for involuntary manslaughter by child abuse and An for negligence. The authorities were taking action, but it was much too little too late for the child they'd failed, and this rightfully disgusted South Korean citizens who were quickly becoming aware of what happened. Before the new year, a petition demanding harsher punishments for child abusers rapidly amassed over 230,000 signatures. In response to this, the government would promise an investigation into Jung In's case, and also promise to reform its prevention of and responses to child abuse. In January of 2021, when the trial began, the situation would gain even more publicity thanks to a report on a show called Unanswered Questions, which aired on SBS. Now, when the Korean people at large learned that the child's abuse had been consistently swept aside, there was an uproar, and a whole lot more attention suddenly aimed at the handling of the case, rather than just on the abuse on its own. The police themselves were heavily scrutinized for their failures, with the public demanding that the officers responsible for mishandling the repeated reports face consequences. At some stage during the trial, Zhang would admit to prosecutors that she'd punched Zhang In in the stomach when she'd refused to eat, but she denied using, quote, a force that could rupture her organs. She also admitted to shaking the child in the air and then dropping her on the floor the day that she died, with her lawyer stating that, quote, She feels the anger of the public, but she did not mean to kill the girl. She admits that she mistreated the girl on the day she died, but doesn't think what she did killed the child. This does beg the question, what exactly does she think killed her baby, if not her consistent violent abuse? From what we can tell, she's never offered an explanation. As time rolled on, Zhang seemed to accept that she was at the center of a national controversy and told the court that she would, quote, kneel and seek the forgiveness of her deceased daughter, adding that she would, quote, accept any punishment for her crimes. Despite this, she would consistently claim that she didn't step on Zhang In or throw her on the floor in spite of having admitted to dropping her earlier in the trial. This denial came in response to the testimony of one Lee Jung Bin, a professor at Gachin University of Medicine and Science, who stated that the child was likely, quote, stomped on by the defendant. 
He believed this occurred due to the child's ruptured pancreas and mesentery, which in his opinion were more likely to have been caused by feet rather than fists. Lee would add that he believed the reason Zhang assaulted the child with her feet rather than her arms was because at the time, she'd recently received breast surgery. In May of 2021, Zhang was convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison, which was less than the prosecutor and public wanted, but even this was short-lived. Later that year, on November 26, 2021, her sentence was reduced to 35 years in prison as the court found that there was no intention of committing murder. This is of course a loophole in the child abuse laws of Korea that has been an out for violent guardians for a very long time, since it's almost impossible to prove a deliberate intention to kill when there's been a sustained period of physical abuse preceding the death. As for On, the adoptive father, well, he received five years in prison for negligence or aiding in the abuse, depending on who you ask. So how was this terrible thing ever allowed to happen, and why was the abuse able to continue for so long? Well, the truth is that there are so many facets to the failures here that we'd be here all day if we tried to cover each of them in detail. Instead, we'll cover the most egregious as succinctly as we can. Firstly, the adoption agency, Holtz Children's Services, allegedly rushed the adoption process, allowing the couple that would go on to kill Jung-in to take custody of her on the day they met her. A 2014 investigation into Holt found that the agency carried out, quote, haphazard inspections according to the Granite Tower, and the agency's own records would also bring to light that they'd been aware of the abuse as early as May of 2020, when the parents had failed to explain Jung-in's bruises. Instead of taking action, Holt continually allowed the couple to stall, such as in one instance where Holt accepted a request to delay a mandatory home visit. The inaction of the police was also rightly criticized, and while the public and the powers that be are happy to reprimand the specific precinct that handled Jungin's case, when we learn a little more about the core of the problem, it starts to seem likely that any other branch of South Korean law enforcement would have made the same mistakes. Now, why is that? Apparently, if police had chosen to separate Jung-in from her adoptive parents, Jung and An could have filed an excessive use of force complaint against those specific officers, which may have threatened their jobs. When speaking to a local newspaper, one officer stated, quote, It's realistically difficult for police officers to separate any child from their parents without any guaranteed authority. Whether or not such a report would have actually resulted in these cops being fired is unclear, but you would hope that it would be disregarded given the undeniable proof of abuse. Now, of course, we are still not done here. The Child Protection Institution dropped the ball as well, and is in itself a complex and unruly entity. The CPI is managed by several nonprofit organizations, one of which is called Good Neighbors. Representatives from Good Neighbors accompanied police on field investigations for each report of Jung and suspected abuse, and on every occasion, they failed to recognize her as an abused child. It's hard to tell which issues come from lackluster training and which are down to their flawed evaluation process. Said evaluation process includes two items that require verbal answers from a child, and in the case of infants, who are nonverbal, these items are omitted rather than replaced with something useful. As you can imagine, this sort of thing leaves gaps in the findings for any kid too young to speak for themselves. So Good Neighbors was ineffective, but the other players involved in child welfare didn't seem to be much better, and a key component of the issue is that with several organizations involved, a lot gets lost in communication. According to Jian Li, a lawyer and director of the Korea Child Care Promotion Institute, quote, the three agencies are unable to work together efficiently. When something like jong ins case happens, they're too busy shifting the blame to each other. They have to decide who is in charge of each part of the case. But there are only 240 child abuse officials and over 30,000 cases reported. They're terribly understaffed. On account of the uproar, the South Korean Assembly hastily passed several new child protection laws, which included a ban on corporal punishment in the home, and required police to investigate a potential abuse situation immediately after being alerted by medical professionals or child welfare agencies. How well this is going to be enforced remains to be seen. Again, we could go on forever about the many, many organizations, institutions, and individuals who failed this child, but at the end of the day, this case just leaves you wondering why these people bothered adopting a kid at all. In the text I showed you earlier, they talked about this baby as if they despised her, and perhaps they did. Either way, it goes without saying that people like this really should not ever be allowed to be parents in the first place. This video was written and researched by Lux Noctis, edited by Darkfire Productions, with additional writing and research by yours truly.
It goes without saying that kids aren't always the easiest to handle, but what happens when a child's mental health takes a nosedive and nothing seems to be helping? When few options remain, it's not unheard of for guardians to turn to alternative forms of therapy. At best, their results vary, but are relatively harmless. As we'll soon see, however, at their worst, the choice to put your child in the hands of an unlicensed practitioner can prove to be fatal. Tonight we'll be discussing Candace Newmaker, a young girl who was failed by virtually every adult around her. But before we discuss how her life came to an end, we must first understand how she ended up in the situation to begin with. Born in North Carolina to a teenage mother and a violent father, the deck was stacked against young Candace Tiara Elmore from the very start. The information we could find about her earliest years paints a picture of instability, with she and her sisters living in various trailers and dilapidated homes throughout the state. Candace was only three years old when she and the other children in her household were removed from their parents' care by social services. In spite of this intervention, however, things seemingly remained chaotic. Candace was shuffled from one care to the next. She'd lived in six different foster homes in just two short years before finally being adopted at the age of five. Her adoptive mother was one Jean Newmaker, a pediatric nurse. While we might expect her work with children to have her ready for the parenting challenges she was about to face, Jean herself would later admit that she was not at all equipped for the difficulties Candace would bring into her life. It would quickly become clear to Mrs. Newmaker that her child appeared to present severe psychological issues. She launched into extended fits of rage, had killed her pet goldfish on one occasion, started a fire in the home on another, and perhaps most troublingly, had once sexually assaulted two children. Jean would go on to describe her daughter as, quote, extremely defensive at home, which will make more sense in just a moment. When Candace was seven, Mrs. Newmaker began to further her efforts to address what was going on. These included the use of several drugs and traditional therapy, though unfortunately the sessions, quote, often ended with her biting or spitting at the therapist, according to ABC. While this might seem paradoxical given the behavior that we've heard about so far, the girls' school teachers didn't seem to feel she was badly behaved at all. What this might indicate is that her issues were closely tied to figures she viewed as parental, and this was exactly the line of thought that her adoptive mother would run with. Mrs. Newmaker was convinced that her daughter was suffering from a condition known as Reactive Attachment Disorder, or RAD for short. It's described by the Mayo Clinic as, quote, a rare but serious condition in which an infant or young child does not establish healthy attachments with parents or caregivers. Reactive attachment disorder may develop if the child's basic needs for comfort, affection, and nurturing aren't met, and loving, caring, stable attachments with others are not established. Furthermore, signs and symptoms of RAD may include unexplained withdrawal, fear, sadness, or irritability, a sad or listless appearance, not seeking comfort or showing no response when comfort is given, not expressing emotions of conscience like remorse or regret, and having tantrums or being more irritable than their age or current circumstance might account for. Again, RAD presents challenges bonding with caregivers, usually as a result of neglect and or abuse, and seems to appear more frequently in children who have faced instability, be it spending time in foster care or having been taken away from their primary caregivers after forming a bond with them. Whether or not Candace truly had RAD is unclear, as the condition sometimes is believed to have been overdiagnosed, and there is also the issue of just how complex these sorts of things are. One condition may be mistaken for another due to overlapping symptoms, for example, but nonetheless, RAD is real and Candace was being treated for it. Again, Mrs. Newmaker did supposedly exhaust all traditional means as far as therapy and medications were concerned. Nothing seemed to really be fixing the issue, and that's when the desperate mother happened upon something called reattachment therapy, sometimes also known as rebirthing. As the title implies, its intention was supposedly to forge or reforge a parent-child bond between the patient and their caregiver. From what we could find, however, much of this therapy seemed to boil down to fully grown adults pinning children down and chastising them. Needless to say, reattachment therapy is considered pseudoscience and is highly controversial. Still, desperate parents trying to do what they can for their children have ended up paying money for them to undergo such therapy, and this same desperation is what led Candace and her mother to Evergreen, Colorado in April of 2000. 
Candace was to undergo a two-week reattachment therapy course, the first week of which apparently went off without a hitch and seemed to maybe even be helping the now 10-year-old girl. Week two was where things would go terribly wrong. As part of the second week, Candace would undergo a rebirthing session. The idea is that the child will be lightly confined through some means, in this case a blanket and some cushions, and be forced to struggle against this restraint, against their parents, their therapists, or both, for an extended period of time. If the child becomes becomes angry or aggressive, the therapists are to tighten their grip. Allegedly, the aim here is to show the child that they can be controlled and also feel safe while under that control. Eventually, after being pinned down and yelled at for whatever arbitrary amount of time the practitioner feels is necessary, the patient is supposed to force their way free in a simulated rebirth. Some, of course, believe that this would result in the creation of that aforementioned missing child-parent bond. On April 18th, Candace's rebirthing would be carried out with no less than five adults present. Present. The first was Connell Watkins, an unlicensed therapist. The session itself would take place in the basement of her home. The second was Julie Ponder, another unlicensed therapist. Next, there was Brita St. Clair, an office manager who, as far as we can tell, was not pretending to be a therapist, and her boyfriend, Jack McDaniel, an intern. Finally, there, of course, was Mrs. Newmaker. The session was videotaped, and this tape would later be shown in court. The transcript tells a disturbing story. Candace is instructed to assume the fetal position, where she's wrapped in a sheet and covered in a number of pillows. Four of the attending adults then begin to press on the child, and that's when Julie Ponder begins asking questions. So imagine yourself as a teeny little baby inside your mother's womb and what it felt like. Warm. It felt tight because her stomach was all around you. What do you think you thought about when you were in there? Candace tells Ponder that she thought she was going to die in there, and that's when Mrs. Newmaker chimes in, talking about how she's expecting and excited, hoping for a little girl she can love and keep safe. Watkins steps in and tells Candace that if the baby doesn't decide to be born, then it dies, and that it's actually a wonderful thing when a baby chooses to be born. Candace is then asked if she's ready to be reborn, and this is where things take a very dark turn. Ponder explains that the baby has to come out head first, how the girl has to push really hard with her feet in order to escape, and how both she and her mother will die if she doesn't do this. She frantically asks who's sitting on her as tears begin streaming down her face. She begs them to stop pushing on her and reiterates several times that she cannot breathe. At one point, she flat out tells them that she is going to die. Do you want to die? Ponder asks, to which Candace replies, No, but I'm going to. Please, I can't breathe. I can't do it anymore. Please quit pushing on me. The child then begs for help, at which point Watkins and Mrs. Newmaker launch into roleplay, with the mother saying she's feeling the contractions associated with labor. Candace tells the adults that she's going to die several more times and says, quote, Can you let me have some oxygen? You mean like you want me to die for real? To which Ponder replies, Uh-huh. Go ahead and die right now. For real. Soon after, Watkins tells Candace to, quote, just go ahead and die. It's easier. It takes a lot of courage to be born. When the child mentions again that she was promised oxygen, Watkins adds, quote, you gotta fight for it. Around 20 minutes into the traumatic ordeal, Candace vomits and says that she needs to use the bathroom. When she inevitably defecates in her pants, the therapists tell her to, quote, go ahead and to, quote, stay in there with the poop and vomit. When Candace later states that it's hot and reiterates again that she cannot breathe, Ponder tells her to scream. Candace, in response, simply says, no. Over 30 minutes in, Ponder is asking for more pressure on the child, and intern Jack McDaniel, who will remind you is a fully grown man, is leaning on a pillow on the girl's head. Quote, getting pretty tight in there, Watkins says, to which Ponder responds, quote, yep, less and less air all the time. She gets to be stuck in there with her own puke and poop. At the 40 minute mark, Watkins calls Candace a quitter, and that's when the girl spoke her final word, no. The adults continue to berate an unresponsive Candace before taking a break, during which the therapists chat about their dream homes while a child lies dead in the room. This goes on until more than an hour after the session began. Watkins says, let's talk to the twerp. When Candace is unwrapped, she adds, quote, oh, there she is sleeping in her vomit. The combined weight of the adults leaning on Candace was over 600 pounds, though they would claim that they weren't all applying pressure at the same time, as though that makes any difference. 
The Guardian reported that Candace appeared blue when the blankets were removed. It was soon determined that the girl was likely dead due to asphyxiation a full 20 minutes before being uncovered. Upon seeing her body, Mrs. Newmaker screamed and Connell Watkins attempted CPR. 911 was called and paramedics were on the scene in around 10 minutes. While they managed to restore the child's pulse, she was later declared brain dead and passed away at the hospital the next day. There's little to be said about the immediate aftermath, though during the inevitable legal proceedings, Watkins, the child abusing fraud, would act as though she wasn't just responsible for killing a child. Quote, Candace's death is a tragedy and so is her life. I think of her story as being an American tragedy because there are thousands of children in this country today who have suffered trauma during their first two years of life. They will be misdiagnosed and mistreated and ineffectively treated for years. Many of them, if they're lucky, will be adopted by loving parents, much like Jean Newmaker, and they will devote their resources and all their energy to help heal their children from emotional and behavioral problems that they didn't create. And when they fail, they will be blamed. This is a quote from Watkins, having completely failed to understand that Mrs. Newmaker was not the problem. Rather, the problem was that a child needlessly died in Watkins' own basement because she and her unqualified friends had no clue what they were doing and charged a struggling parent thousands of dollars to do it anyway. On April 20th, 2001, both unlicensed therapists were found guilty of reckless child abuse resulting in death. They were each given the maximum sentence for their charge, 16 years in prison. The assistants and the adoptive mother were tried later that same year, with Sinclair and McDaniel receiving 10 years of probation for criminally negligent child abuse and being sentenced to serve 1,000 hours community service as a part of a plea bargain. Jean Newmaker pled guilty to neglect and abuse and was given a four-year suspended sentence, after which the charges were cleared from her record. In 2006, during an ABC interview, Connell Watkins would solidify her position as the main villain in this piece by continuing to shirk all responsibility. Quote, there was no weight on her. She can sit up. She can stand up. We're just sitting on the ground. She could push us away easily. She would even blame Candace, the victim in all this, on several occasions, claiming that the 10-year-old girl would have escaped the four adults who suffocated her if she'd really wanted to. As a result of this tragedy, Candace's law was passed, outlawing rebirthing as a treatment in the state of Colorado. Other states have since passed comparable legislation in an attempt to prevent such an incident from happening again. Candace Newmaker's story is a testament to the dangers of putting our health, our lives, and especially the lives of our children into the hands of those doing nothing more than peddling snake oil. Just in case you missed it, my last video was about a website that contains some very troubling content involving children, and I have to admit that by the time I finished making said video, I was left feeling somewhat frustrated. I've reported whatever I could, and whether or not any of this makes a difference is yet to be seen, but nonetheless, I wanted to see if there was more I could do somehow. If you head over to the official FBI website and go to their wanted listing, you'll find a special page dedicated to a program called ECAP. ECAP stands for Endangered Child Alert Program, and it was founded jointly in 2004 by both the FBI and the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children with one specific goal in mind, and that was to draw attention to adults dubbed John and Jane Doe who were spotted in child sexual abuse material, be it photos, videos, audio clips, etc. Now, having said that, nothing I'm about to show you is inherently graphic. The FBI does make sure to censor the images slash video before their release, but despite all this, of course, if you're sensitive to this sort of subject matter, then I highly recommend skipping this video. If you do decide to stick around, however, I will be issuing extra warnings before each suspect as needed, just to give you an extra heads up. I am also going to link the ECAT page down below, and if you think you have any information regarding these people, I'm going to ask that you follow the instructions provided on the FBI website and notify them ASAP. I don't have the power to arrest people, so please prioritize that instead of sending leads my way. And with that all said, I'm sure we're all dreading this, but let's get into it. First up is a man dubbed John Doe 5. The first several of these suspects I'm going to show you don't have a whole lot as far as clues go, but nonetheless, I want to ask that you take a good look anyway. According to the FBI, John Doe 5 was spotted in images of using young children, and said images were found online. While his current whereabouts and identity are unknown, he's described as a white male in his late 30s or 40s with dark hair and dark eyes. His most distinguishing feature is a mole on his left cheek. A composite sketch has also been provided. Next up is John Doe 8. 
According to the FBI, images of this person abusing a young girl were found in a video online in May of 2005, and to this day he still has not been identified. We can see from the photos that this person has dark hair and a light complexion, but the only other bits of possibly identifying information are this mark on his right forearm and this ring on his left hand, implying marriage. The FBI estimates this individual to be approximately 180 to 200 pounds. John Doe 19 is alleged to be involved in the attempted sexual exploitation of children and the sexual abuse of a minor. His report states that images of him were found in a video that was being traded online. No official description is provided for this suspect, but based on the three images provided, we can see that he's got short dark hair along with some kind of necklace. He also appears in the photos to be relatively young, maybe in his late 20s or 30s, although no date was provided for when these images might have been created. Nonetheless, a pretty good portion of his face is visible, and anyone who might know him could still recognize him. John Doe 40 is a white male between the ages of 30 and 40 and is believed to have critical information pertaining to the identity of a child victim in a sexual exploitation investigation. Unfortunately, this is another case where not much information has been provided, but he's described by the FBI as being heavy set with dark hair and also speaking English in a video believed to have been produced prior to October of 2017. Whether or not John Doe 40 had any specific accent isn't mentioned, but investigators have provided a composite sketch to approximate his appearance. Up next is our first Jane Doe. Jane Doe 37 is a white middle-aged female with dark hair and thick glasses, and is believed to have critical information pertaining to the identity of a child victim in an ongoing sexual exploitation investigation. The FBI claims that videos containing Jane Doe 27 were first discovered in June 2014, but data extracted from their files indicate they were produced in April of 2012. They also add that audio from the Land Before Time is heard in the background of the video in question. A composite sketch is also provided here, but the FBI adds that due to the age of the images, this person's appearance is likely to have changed by now. John Doe 41. He appears to be the youngest suspect on this entire list, with the FBI putting him at about 18 to 20 years of age. Just like the last few suspects, John Doe 41 is believed to have critical information on the identity of a male child in a sexual exploitation investigation. The video in question here is believed to have been produced between 2016 and 2018, and appears to primarily occur within a bathroom. Quite a few images are provided here, but unfortunately we don't see as much of John Doe's face as we'd like. The first two pictures are both close-ups. John Doe 41 can be seen wearing glasses and a white backwards hat. He also appears to have light facial hair and mild acne. The rest of the provided images are the interior of the bathroom. A tub and some hygienic items, a toilet and blue patterned shower curtain, more items, and finally a door. Note the coloring and weathering on the image's left side. Next, we have Jane Doe 35, and our very first audio clip. Before we get to that, though, the FBI states that Jane Doe 35 is believed to have critical information pertaining to the health and welfare of a child. They also note that this person is not the subject of a criminal investigation, but nonetheless, she seems integral to solving one. Jane Doe 35 is a white female with brown hair. Her age is listed as unknown, but images have been provided that give a pretty good view of her face. The FBI also adds that in the audio clip, she can be heard speaking English with an accent consistent with the North American dialect. Said clip features Jane Doe 35 talking for roughly four seconds, and nothing inherently disturbing is apparent. What are you doing? I'm at my belly. This is John Doe 13. And this time we finally have video, albeit low quality video. According to the FBI, images of this man show him sexually abusing a young girl. He's described as white, balding with brown hair, and approximately 180 to 200 pounds. No further information is given, but the video appears to have been taken via webcam, possibly from a hotel room. No audio is available either, but we do see what looks like a gray couch in the background, along with what might be a pet jumping onto it in its final frame. A few stills are provided, and from them, a composite sketch was created. Jane Doe 36, according to the FBI, is not the subject of a criminal investigation, but is believed to have critical information pertaining to the health and welfare of a child. Jane Doe is described as white, between 30 and 40, with long curly brown hair. The images you see here are presumed to be from August 2016, and in them, Jane Doe is wearing a pink top and black pants with polka dots. Also provided is a shot of the location where Jane Doe was pictured, and while this is only going to be recognizable to anyone who's actually been here, I'd like you to take a close look anyway, just in case. 
Coming up next is an individual known as John Doe 29. It's not clear if this person is the subject of a criminal investigation or not, but the FBI suspects that he has critical information on the identity of a child in an ongoing sexual exploitation investigation. They also explain that images of John Doe 29 were first uncovered by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in January of 2008. And it seems that over a decade later, all that's come up are dead ends. Here we see a silver ring on John Doe's left hand, and here a child's Nike shoe. The next image is of the location's exterior. Note the pattern of the groundwork and the tree line that's off in the distance. There also seems to be a building in the background. The next photo is another exterior shot. The foreground featuring what's presumably a wooden bench, and in the background we see a pool and some chairs. Again, note the presence of the greenery in this shot. Last, we have this. It's mostly covered, but what we see is more of the same brick path, and we also see a bit of what seems to be either a stone or faux stone wall, along with what's described in the caption as a table. Although these images are rather old at this point, there's still a pretty good chance that some of these structures remain intact. That said, if you think you know where this is, but you might not be sure, then what I recommend doing is going onto Google Maps and checking out the location, and seeing if there are any landmarks that you can match up. Here we have Jane Doe 39. This is one of the few unidentified individuals currently listed that the FBI created a video for, so I think it's best if you take a look for yourself at what they had to say. John Doe 17. This is probably one of the worst entries in this whole video, and I'll get to why in a second. The FBI states that John Doe 17 is alleged to have been involved in the transportation of child sexual abuse material by means of a computer. They describe him as a white male, approximately 210 to 250 pounds, with curly brown hair. We don't get any additional info as to the date of the images, but we are provided with brief audio and video. Just a disclaimer, what I'm about to show you is not inherently graphic, but it does involve an adult male seemingly asking a child to try on swimwear. The child's voice, of course, has been removed, and the audio and video separated. The clip in question is just a few seconds long, and features John Doe 17 standing in front of a bed with white sheets and dark pillows. We see John Doe pick up what appears to be a child-size one-piece swimsuit, and then the clip ends. Here it is again, but slowed down. And here's the audio. That way we can see how the suit needs to fit you. See, if, we take, if he takes those pictures, then he knows what the suit look, needs to look like. All right, let me put it over your head, and you can put your arm. Now remember, this is his suit. Looks like it would be nice and cool in the summertime, though. No, I didn't say we could go swimming. Swimming is, uh, it's too cold out. Well, more than I want to pay for it right now. I think that part goes in the front. I think it's shorter than the other side. I think it goes in the front. Take them off your feet and turn them around. Try that and let's see how it works. So the last bit about John Doe 17 that we need to talk about are the last couple images provided. As you can see here, there are close-ups of John Doe's sweatshirt. The caption reads, If suggesting Phoenix Sun's logo, please be specific with the year or origin of this particular design. My researcher Lux took it upon himself to try and track this thing down, and here's what he came up with. As you can see, the exposed parts of the pattern appear to match up pretty well with the image seen in this listing. This was posted to Lux's Twitter, and here's a response. A follower claiming that the design in question was used between 1993 and 2000. Now, we obviously can't tell for sure if this is what it is, but nonetheless, Lux has passed on this information to the FBI. If you think you can better identify this article of clothing, as always, please submit a tip. And with that, we've arrived at our last suspect of the day, John Doe 42. I will say out of all of them, this guy pisses me off the most, and once we get to it, I'm sure you'll see why. Just as many before him, John Doe 42 is believed to have critical information regarding the identity of a child victim in a sexual exploitation investigation. A video featuring John Doe 42 is believed to have been produced prior to October of 2015. The images provided are all of John Doe's face, two of which show him looking directly at the camera. As you can see, this person is a white male, probably around 50 or 60, and balding. The audio clip provided is brief, but some might find it disturbing given the context. Again, nothing overtly explicit is depicted, but nonetheless, please proceed with caution. It's nice, though.
Well, wasn't that entire video just horrible? Anyway, like I said, information on ECAT will be posted down below, and if you think you have any info, please alert the FBI immediately with as much detail as possible. Sex tourism and red light districts flourish around the US's many worldwide military bases. This, of course, is fueled by factors such as extreme poverty and lack of opportunities. For the Philippines in particular, these issues are impossible to ignore, as millions struggle to survive each and every day. Now, with this harsh reality comes things like prostitution out of desperation or even sex trafficking of young girls and women. It goes without saying that these women face the daily threat of violence. Violence that goes unchecked due to stigma surrounding sex work and, in the case of US military clientele, protection from one of the most powerful nations in the world. Now, many of these girls and women are trans, and in a conservative country like the Philippines or really anywhere, this compounds the risk factors greatly. An encounter with the wrong client is bound to end in violence or worse, death. One such example brings us to Olongapo City, where a trans woman named Jennifer Laude would be killed by a U.S. Marine, sparking both an international incident and social reckoning within her home country. Jennifer Laude was known to those around her by her nickname, Ganda, the local word for beautiful. According to her mother in an interview with Vice, quote, I knew she was a girl when I saw her with her sisters, and she didn't move like a boy, but I never scolded her. By the time Jennifer was approaching her teenage years, she'd started dressing more outwardly feminine, and once it was time for college, she wanted to make sure to find an institution that would allow her to both grow out her hair and don the women's uniform, things typically not allowed in the Catholic country. While she did eventually find a suitable school, she quickly lost interest in her studies, instead opting to earn money, both for herself and for those around her. She did this via a mix of a job at a hair salon in tandem with online sex work, both of which allowed her to financially support her family who, much like many others in the country, suffered from severe poverty. Jennifer's mother noted how she'd pay for repairs to the family home following a typhoon, and how she even lended money to others in the town so they could repair their own homes as well. While things were looking up for Jennifer on the financial front, especially since she started working locally, it goes without saying that finding love was considerably more complicated due to her being trans. Local men weren't too keen on dating a trans woman, and while foreign men seemed to be overall more accepting, they still came with caveats. One such example was a British man that Jennifer had become friendly with while working her job at the salon. The man seemed unfazed by Jennifer being trans, but also explained that he didn't want to be seen with her in public. On another occasion, Jennifer had started seeing a Korean man, but was too afraid to tell him she was trans, and thus avoided any kind of physical intimacy with him before the pair eventually went their separate ways. As for why Jennifer might be too afraid to disclose that she was trans, well, needless to say, the list is quite a sizable one. Of course, there's the high chance of rejection, but even more concerning was the chance of violence, something Jennifer was acutely aware of whenever it came to her work. Now, regardless of all this though, Jennifer would eventually meet the man she considered to be the one, a foreign man by the name of Mark Susselbeck. The two had crossed paths on a travel forum in 2012, but before Mark could visit the Philippines from his native Germany, Jennifer had this to say. Unlike the others, Mark was perfectly accepting of Jennifer, so much so that once he finally made his way to the Philippines in late 2012, he proposed to her on stage at a local mall where hundreds could bear witness. By the fall of 2014, the pair were bound for some fairly sizable milestones. The plan was for Jennifer to move to Germany with Mark and for the two to finally wed, and if not for an issue securing her visa, Jennifer would have already left the country by the time her life was cut short. October 11th, 2014. It's the evening, and 19-year-old Lance Corporal Joseph Scott Pemberton and a few of his fellow Marines have decided to head out for a night on the town. Before long, the group found themselves at one ambience nightlife bar, not far from the vessel on which they were stationed was docked. There, Pemberton would meet several working girls, two of which he'd find himself leaving the bar with, 26-year-old Jennifer Laude and her friend Barbie Galviro. 
By 10.55 p.m., the trio arrived at a nearby motel, quickly checking into room one, with Barbie leaving moments later to allow Pemberton and Jennifer to go about their business. Around a half hour later, Pemberton left the motel and eventually made his way back to base. There, his colleagues who were out with him that night were waiting, having no idea where Pemberton had wandered off to. It's then that the Marine pulled one of these men aside and began making a grim confession. He explained that he might have killed someone he coldly referred to as an it. Initially, his colleague thought he was joking, but it would quickly become apparent that this was absolutely not the case. When police arrived on the scene, they found Jennifer dead her body hunched over and her head in a toilet bowl. The Naval Criminal Investigative Service arrived not long after the local authorities, having caught wind that an American might be involved even before Pemberton had confessed to his colleague. Now, this was likely thanks to the motel's receptionist, who'd entered the room to clean after Pemberton left, discovered Jennifer, and then ran to the local police station to report the body. They told police about an, quote, unidentified white male foreigner with a marine-style cut of hair leaving room one. Exactly what happened in that room would be the subject of upcoming legal proceedings, so once we get there, we'll talk about what the defense had to say versus what the facts tell us. For now, though, we'll discuss the aftermath. Just after midnight, Jennifer's body was taken to the St. Martin Funeral Home and formally identified by her middle sister Michelle and her aforementioned friend Barbie. The next day, the U.S. Embassy expressed its sympathies to Jennifer's family and vowed to investigate the involvement of an American in the crime. The day after that, Pemberton became a suspect after investigators reviewed surveillance footage which showed him leaving the Ambience nightclub with the victim. Barbie would also go on to single Pemberton out in a police lineup. This is the point where politics began to come into play. Due to his suspected involvement in the murder, the U.S. took custody of Pemberton and held him on board one of the two ships that had brought American servicemen to the Philippines. The Filipino authorities were keen for the U.S. to hand the suspect over to them. However, the United States refused, citing their rights under the Visiting Forces Agreement. Now, as for what that is, without getting too bogged down in the minutia, the VFA is essentially an agreement signed in the late 80s that relaxed visa restrictions for U.S. personnel and allowed military vessels and aircraft access to the Philippines. While it does mean that American troops can come and go as they please for the purposes of military exercises and the like, based on what we could find, the agreement also gives the Philippines primary jurisdiction over U.S. military personnel accused of crimes in the country, unless those crimes are committed against other U.S. personnel. So while they might have cited the VFA as their justification for keeping a hold of Pemberton, this was likely a case of the U.S. throwing its weight around. In mid-October 2014, an autopsy revealed that Jennifer's cause of death was, quote, asphyxia by drowning. Shortly after this was determined, the Laude family filed civil murder charges against the Marine, as they weren't convinced that the government of the Philippines were actively building a case on their behalf. When Pemberton missed the first hearing of this civil trial, the Laude family threatened to sue the government on the grounds that they were betraying the Filipino people by failing to gain custody of Pemberton, and by not compelling him to appear in court. As a result of public outrage, protests took place in front of the vessel in which the man was being held. Again, the Philippines is a heavily conservative country, with a hard majority of its citizens being of the Catholic faith, which of course on its own is already enough to massively complicate perception of this case. Another layer at play here are pre-colonial social norms, the most relevant of which in this case being a sort of third gender recognized in Filipino culture, the bakla. This term generally refers to men who take on conventional feminine traits, but isn't strictly defined by their sexual orientation. Still, the term has been used as a catch-all for anything outside the bounds of modern masculine concepts, so being gay or wearing makeup could bring some to use the term bakla, whether it truly applies or not. It is also important to remember that while bakla is a very familiar concept to most Filipinos, it doesn't mean that they or any other LGBTQ communities are always accepted with open arms. Growing up in the Philippines, bakla was probably the most common insult that I would hear kids throw at each other on the playground, and it no doubt had long-lasting repercussions for many. My point in bringing this up, though, is that the gay slash bakla identity is often confused for transgender, and sometimes even used as a way to deny the existence of the latter. In fact, while some may support the rights of gay and lesbian individuals, they might also deny that Jennifer was a woman, instead rolling with a narrative that a U.S. Marine had murdered an innocent gay man with a feminine appearance. Needless to say, LGBTQ identity is extremely complex in the Philippines, just as it is anywhere else in the world. Jennifer's slaying simply made that fact more apparent than it already was. 
In late October, Jennifer was laid to rest, and two months later, on December 19th, Alonkable prosecutors charged Pemberton with murder. A few days later, the accused would appear in public for the first time since the crime, but only to sit in silence as his legal team requested a delay to proceedings in order to appeal to the Department of Justice for a dismissal of the charges. Following this brief excursion, Pemberton was returned to Camp Aguinaldo, where he was being held in a makeshift air-conditioned cell fashioned from a van or storage container depending on where you read. This was a point of great controversy given that, as an offender in the Philippines, by all rights, Pemberton should have been held in New Bilibid Prison, a sweltering institution with over 26,000 inmates at the time. He would have been held there had the U.S. not swept in to save him a matter of hours after the decision was made to send him to the country's largest lockup. Pemberton's eventual trial was problematic, to say the very least. For one, the Philippines does not have a trial by jury system, meaning that the judge assigned to the case had complete control over its outcome. Judge Roland Guinness Habalde would preside over the case, which was questionable at best given the fact that this judge had a personal relationship with Pemberton's defense attorney as the two had attended law school together. Even more worrisome was the fact that the two had actually been spotted chatting together in private. It goes without saying that legal proceedings tend to move at a snail's pace no matter where you are, so it's no surprise that the trial didn't take off immediately. Before it could start in earnest, the Laude family was offered nearly half a million US dollars for their approval to downgrade the charges against Pemberton, which Jennifer's mother quickly shot down. No amount of money could pay for the years I spent raising my child. What they did to my child was gruesome. Just because we're poor does not mean we can't fight for justice. Once it was finally time for Pemberton to take the stand, he would present what's informally known as the gay-slash-LGBTQ panic defense. This tactic is defined by LGBTQbar.org as, quote, a legal strategy that asks a jury to find that a victim's sexual orientation or gender identity-slash-expression is to blame for a defendant's violent reaction, including murder. It is not a freestanding defense to criminal liability, but rather a legal tactic used to bolster other defenses. When a perpetrator uses an LGBTQ plus panic defense, they are claiming that a victim's sexual orientation or gender identity not only explains but excuses a loss of control and the subsequent assault. By fully or partially acquitting the perpetrators of crimes against LGBTQ plus victims, this defense implies that LGBTQ plus lives are worth less than others. In the case of Jennifer and Pemberton, the argument basically boiled down to the Marine claiming self-defense after finding out that Jennifer was trans, as if being trans was somehow a threat to his life. According to him, he pushed Jennifer down, causing her to fall off the bed, to which she reacted by allegedly slapping him in the face. The Marine then choked Jennifer until she fell unconscious, then dragged her to the bathroom to try to wake her up with water. He claims that he found none, and also claimed that he thought Jennifer was alive once he left the room. Again, keep in mind that Jennifer's body was found with her head in the toilet bowl, and the autopsy concluded that she died due to asphyxia by drowning. Now, regardless of this, on December 1st of 2015, the Olongapo City Regional Trial Court found Pemberton guilty of homicide, with the court finding that the crime, quote, did not have the legal elements of the heavier crime of murder. The judge believed that the killer acted out of passion when he arm-locked the deceased and dunked her head in the toilet. Pemberton was sentenced to 6 to 12 years imprisonment, which to many wasn't enough, but certainly more than anyone had expected given the circumstances. In early 2016, his defense filed an appeal hoping to reverse the conviction, but instead of a reversal on March 29, 2016, his jail term was reduced from a maximum of 12 years to a maximum of 10. For several years following this conviction, Pemberton remained in his private climate-controlled cell, guarded by a combination of Filipino soldiers and his American colleagues, all while still picking up a salary. This, in theory, should have been where the story ended, but things are never that simple. In the end, Pemberton was all but entirely let off the hook for the killing of Jennifer Laude, but how did we go from 10 years to him getting away scot-free? Well, as it turns out, the president himself granted Pemberton an absolute pardon in September of 2020. I had heard about Jennifer's case back in 2014 when it first happened, and the news of Pemberton's release felt like it came entirely out of left field. Citizens all over the Philippines were left equally puzzled by the sudden development, and the president's remarks regarding this decision did not help explain the logic at play at all. Quote, I am not favoring anybody, neither Pemberton nor the family of the victim. It's my decision. Correct me if I'm wrong, but here's what I think of the case. You have not treated Pemberton fairly, so I release him pardon. 
This is what then-President Rodrigo Duterte had to say following the announcement, choosing not to elaborate on how exactly Pemberton was treated unfairly or why this pardon was necessary at all. What made this statement even more confusing was the fact that Duterte had previously been vocal about his support for the Laude family, before his presidency even saying that the VFA had left the Philippines looking like fools due to the fact that they couldn't even get real jurisdiction over Pemberton. The president maintained a very anti-American stance even in the months leading up to the pardon, so much so that January of that that year brought about a demand from Duterte to end the VFA within 180 days. So what happened? In June 2020, the Philippine government would pivot and end up doing a complete 180 on its stance following, quote, political and other developments in the region. Developments, in this case, refers to China and its ongoing presence in nearby maritime territory. Another justification for the pardon came from the notion that Pemberton should be released early on good behavior, something that many feel would not have reached the president's desk had it not been for the aforementioned political developments. Regardless of the actual reason for his release, many feel like Pemberton hadn't actually paid for what he did to Jennifer, and that this was yet another case of a U.S. serviceman being prioritized over Filipino citizens in their own home. To some, this may seem like an overreaction to a singular case, but keep in mind that anecdotal accounts from locals over the decades claim that U.S. military personnel have a long-standing history of mistreating Filipinos, something not reflected in official reports or the media. The only other case to gain notoriety in the Philippines was that of Lance Corporal Daniel Smith. In 2006, Smith was given 40 years in prison for raping Suzette Nicole Nicholas, a woman he'd also met at a nightclub while in the country. Smith had allegedly carried the woman out to a van while she was drunk, quote, assaulted her as several other soldiers watched and cheered him on, and then dumped her on a nearby pier. Upon being found guilty, Smith was sent to a Philippine jail, to which the U.S.'s response was to cancel a joint military exercise. Classified documents made public via WikiLeaks in 2011 would prove that the U.S. had pressured the Philippines into handing the offender over. After the Americans pulled the stunt, Smith was housed in a U.S. embassy where he stayed for over two years until Nicholas, quote, unexpectedly recanted her testimony and Smith returned home. Like I said at the start of this video, this issue is not exclusive to the Philippines. Not far from the Philippines is the island of Okinawa, where abuse at the hands of U.S. military personnel has been better documented. Perhaps the most notable case is one dubbed the 1995 Okinawa Rape Incident, where three U.S. servicemen kidnapped and sexually assaulted a 12-year-old girl. This incident, much like the one we just discussed, caused tensions between the U.S. and Japan due to custody issues over the perpetrators. This incident prompted women's counselor Suzio Takazato to begin to document and compile the crimes committed by U.S. servicemen against locals, ultimately culminating in a booklet published a year later. According to a 2021 article by the Japan Times, quote, In February 1996, with the completed first edition of the booklet in hand, she visited the United States with Okinawan women to appeal to the American public and was met with astonishment and tears from some people who said they had no idea of the reality. The group's members delve further into available documents, such as local government materials under the American occupation of Okinawa, official U.S. documents and prefectural history to unearth clues about unresolved cases, eventually publishing a 12th edition Edition, which depicts stark details of roughly 350 U.S. military sex crimes. Although there have been arrests made since the southernmost prefecture of Okinawa was returned to Japan in 1972, Takazato said that based on her experience as a women's counselor, she believes that scores of cases have occurred without ever being prosecuted. Okinawa, the Philippines, we could spend all day hopping from one U.S. base to another and hearing much the same story. In fact, even internal cases of sexual assault are a massive problem within the U.S. military. According to MilitaryTimes.com, a recent report on the matter, quote, estimates that more than 8% of female service members experience unwanted sexual contact in 2021, the highest rate since the department began counting in 2004. For men, it was the second highest figure at 1.5%. Of course, Jennifer's case is distinct given why she was killed. Again, this is a grim reality all too often faced by trans people all over the world, and for as much as we like to believe that this was an isolated incident thousands of miles away, we all know that's not true. Jennifer is absolutely and tragically just one of many. This video was researched and written by Lux Noctis, edited by Darkfire Productions, with additional writing and research by yours truly.
stories with perplexing details leave us wanting more to get to the bottom of what truly transpired. As viewers of my channel will know, however, the whole picture is sometimes just out of reach, leaving us with an incomplete narrative. One such story brings us to 1960s Brazil, where two suited men were found lifeless side by side atop a hill with no apparent signs of injury along with raincoats, cryptic notes, and most bizarre of all, two crudely constructed lead masks in the shape of eyewear. This would later be dubbed by the media as the lead mask case, and it's been the source of wild speculation since the men were found nearly six decades ago. It's a tale laced with accusations of police negligence, possible third party involvement, and even whispers about secret societies and UFO sightings. Whether this case is what it seems to be on the surface or not, the circumstances surrounding how these two men ended up on that hill are fascinating. August 17th, 1966. Two close friends by the name of Miguel Jose Viana, 34, and Miguel Pereira de Cruz, 32, are about to embark on a journey together to buy a car and electronic equipment. Or at least that's what they told their wives when they packed up roughly 3 million cruzarios and set out to catch the 9am bus. Manuel and Miguel were both TV repairmen, so to their families, nothing about this trip seemed too far-fetched. The duo claimed they'd be heading all the way to Sao Paulo, some 400 miles away. Instead, however, they arrived in Niteroi, just outside of Rio de Janeiro, something they'd intentionally planned on based on the bus tickets later recovered by authorities. This was at approximately 2pm, and over the course of the next couple hours, the men made several stops. They first visited an electronic shop, chatted with the owner, and left without making any purchases. Following this, they hopped from one store to another, buying a bottle of mineral water along with two raincoats to go over their suits. Later that afternoon, at about 5pm, a young local boy noticed the pair sitting atop Vintum Hill, but paid them no mind despite admittedly being curious given that these men were in formal attire and had donned the aforementioned raincoats. The next day, curiosity got the best of the boy, and that's when he decided to go and take a peek at the spot where he'd seen the men perched. Surprisingly, Miguel and Manuel were still there, just this time they were lying down. Assuming they were sleeping, the boy once again walked away. The boy's third encounter with the duo would by far be the most shocking. Once again in the area, the boy didn't see Manuel and Miguel, but he did smell something terrible. To his horror, the men hadn't been sleeping at all, but were in fact dead, their bodies in an advanced state of decomposition after being exposed to the elements for what at that point was over three days. When authorities arrived on the scene, they were greeted with far more questions than answers. The first few were obvious. What were these two doing up in the hills dressed the way they were, and how did they die given that there were no apparent signs of injury to either corpse? Beside the bodies was the water bottle they'd purchased just before making their way up the hill, but also present were two extremely bizarre things in particular. The first being a pair of DIY lead masks in the shape of glasses, and the second being some notes containing basic electrical equations, and most notably, the following instructions. Also of note was the fact that Miguel was reported to have roughly 157,000 cruzarios on him while Manuel had just 4,000, a far cry from the combined 3 million or so they supposedly started with. The pair were quickly identified, which allowed authorities to cast a wide net for their initial investigation. To many, this may have seemed like it was Manuel and Miguel's intended outcome, but based on the notes, it's not hard to come to the conclusion that the men did not intend to die on that hill. If so, what really happened? Were they robbed, set up, maybe even gotten into some kind of accident? The first step would be to find out exactly what Manuel and Miguel were trying to do atop that hill, because buying a car definitely was not it. According to accounts at the time, the bodies of both men were sent in for autopsies and examined for signs of poisoning, all of which returned negative. With science unable to draw any conclusions, the authorities began turning to the pair's friends and family, all while the media began to fuel public speculation. One local man caught wind of the story and felt that he had information important to the case. He explained to authorities that on the night of August 17th, 
His wife and children had been driving nearby Ventum Hill and stopped to look at what appeared to be a UFO floating above it, or at least an oval object that appeared orange in color which had what was described as a band of fire around its edges. Soon, other locals would come forward to corroborate this sighting. Meanwhile, the police managed to gather a fair bit of interesting information regarding the two friends. This is when the pair's cover story came to light via their widows, and even more would come from the men's direct family members. According to Miguel's sister, before his departure on August 17th, he'd explained that he had some kind of mission to carry out, and an important one at that. As for what it entailed, she claims he wouldn't say. Now, it's time that one Alicio Gomez would enter the picture, a name that you're going to hear a lot throughout the duration of this episode. Gomez was described by one of the widows as being Miguel and Manuel's assistant, but now he would become a suspect. Taken into custody for allegedly providing conflicting accounts, Gomez would go on to explain that the two men were what they called scientific spiritists. He claimed they'd engage in experiments and even ran a clandestine radio station in their spare time. Gomez would also explain that the men were a part of some kind of secret society, and that most TV repair technicians were also practicing scientific spiritism. Eventually, police would lose interest in Gomez, and while Manuel's widow had claimed to have seen the two having an argument, his brother would later go on record in a 90s TV documentary, stating he didn't suspect Gomez of foul play. Either way, police were on the lookout for a possible third person. In the documentary just mentioned, it was also stated that the men were found with foliage on the ground that had been neatly cut with some kind of blade, but no such tool or item was ever recovered from the scene. Also puzzling was the fact that according to reports at the time, the note on the men didn't bear their handwriting. Maybe what's even more curious here is the fact that Manuel and Miguel aren't even the first lead mask case. In 1962, a man by the name of Hermes, also a TV repairman, was found dead atop a hill. This case, however, has been mostly lost to time and therefore lacks sufficient details to connect it to what happened in 1966. Scientific Spiritism this may sound a tad confusing since most people are used to hearing the word spiritualism, and even then the word means different things depending on who you ask. Either way, spiritism and spiritualism are not exactly the same thing, even if they very much sound like it. As far as contemporary movements go, spiritualism is generally agreed as having been popularized in earnest by the Fox sisters in 1848 after they supposedly channeled a spirit right before their neighbor's eyes from right within the comfort of their upstate New York home. Word quickly spread about the girl's feet, paving the way for a sort of spiritualist craze at the time. This is where a lot of classic iconography of spirit communication comes from, especially the more theatrical things like seances while gathered around a table, for example. Just over a decade later, spirit photography came onto the scene and really has not gone away ever since. Needless to say, people were dabbling in all manner of new attempts to unravel the mysteries of the afterlife, and it wasn't limited to just everyday citizens. According to WhiteHouseHistory.org, First Lady Mary Todd Lincoln practiced spiritualism, first doing so after the death of her second youngest son in 1862, when the boy was just 11 years old. Eventually, Mary would hold seances in the Red Room of the White House, some of which were attended by none other than President Abraham Lincoln himself. While probably the most noteworthy practitioners of spiritualism in this era, the Lincolns were far from the only prominent names on that roster. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was an outspoken advocate for spiritualism, and while not necessarily sold on spiritualist methods, Thomas Edison even joined the fold at one point with his attempt at creating a telephone that could contact those on the other side. Speaking of the other side, spiritualism had also had its fair share of critics, the most notable of which probably being Harry Houdini. While most people know of Houdini for his work as a magician and escape artist, he also spent a considerable amount of energy debunking fraudulent mediums, even going as far as to testify in front of Congress hoping to get fortune-telling banned in Washington, D.C. With such big names battling at either side of the spectrum, it's not hard to see just how widespread spiritualism had become at the time. That said, Spiritualism was never a formal movement. It wasn't founded by a singular individual and codified, but spiritism was. Spiritism is considered to have gotten its start in 1857, more than a decade after the Fox sisters had thrown the US into a paranormal frenzy. More specifically, its origins hail from a book, simply called The Spirit Book, authored by French educator Alan Kardec. 
Kardec had also gotten caught up in the spectacle of seances and spirit communication, which led him to digging into mediumship himself, eventually birthing what he called spiritism, which he described as, quote, a science which deals with the nature, origin, and destiny of spirits, as well as their relationship with the corporeal world. Today, both spiritualism and spiritism live on in various forms all across the globe, but when it comes to spiritism in particular, there's one country that stands out from the rest, and that, of course, brings us back to Brazil. In the late 60s and 70s, spiritism experienced a surge in popularity thanks to the works of philanthropist Chico Javier, who wrote books on the subject and even appeared on national television a number of times, setting records while doing so. Towards the end of his life, Javier would be nominated by over 2 million people to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. Needless to say, the man was popular, and today Brazil is said to have the largest concentration of spiritists on the planet at approximately 4 million strong. Just like any idea and with spiritualism before it, spiritism has splintered off into an infinite amount of forms that vary from follower to follower. With this in mind, we can now turn our attention back to Miguel and Manuel. A book on spiritism was found in Miguel's workshop alongside remnants of lead, the pages highlighting sections about mass, intense light, and of course, spirits. Now, this is where Manuel and Miguel really seem to apply their own flair to this. According to Gomez, the pair had long held hopes of communicating with beings on Mars, presumably what they considered to be Martian spirits. They did this through experiments, one of which would even fuel local myths of UFOs and extraterrestrial life. June 13th, 1966. Residents of Campos are witnessing what they believe to be a UFO floating above the water just offshore. Whatever this object was, it was bright. So bright, in fact, that some described it as almost blinding. After just several minutes, the object began to rise, and soon after, it exploded, the boom being so loud that it was allegedly heard from miles away. Locals in the area, and in particular fishermen who had a front row seat, claimed that they saw the UFO fall into the sea. This event caused enough of a ruckus for Brazilian military intelligence to get involved, although not much details on their findings seems to have made its way to the public eye. They do mention having intercepted some kind of bizarre conversation over the radio on June 12th, but that's as much as anyone seems to know on that topic. That said, I'm sure you can already see where I'm going with this. According to Gomez, he was invited by our two lead mass men to attend an experiment in Manuel's garden, something that was also confirmed by Manuel's very own father as having taken place. Although the details are unclear, Gomez explained that the friends had created some kind of device, and we can only assume that it exploding was not part of their plan. Whatever this device was, it sounds strikingly similar to the one supposedly seen by locals at Vintum Hill on that fateful August 17th evening. It seems the men were once again trying to use a device as part of their communication with extraterrestrial spirits, only this time there didn't seem to be an explosion so much as just the device going up in flames. Whatever happened, it doesn't seem like this part of the experiment caused Manuel and Miguel's death since, again, there were no signs of injury to either body. With all of these factors in mind, really the only logical explanation we're left with is that whatever these men ingested is what killed them, but what about the autopsy and toxicology reports? Well, as you might expect, that's probably the most hotly contested part of this case. There are so many different heads talking at once that when it comes to the science here, it's not easy to figure out who to believe. We do know almost for certain that there were capsules involved, and presumably the men did take them based on the bottle of water that they bought on their way to the hill. Still, nowhere in my research did I find any reports about either the whole capsules or the remnants being found anywhere over the course of the investigation. In the 90s TV documentary, the medical examiner who worked on the case said himself that the men had been thoroughly examined for signs of poisoning, and that parts of their organs were even dissected in the process. Whether or not this is actually true, we'll never know. Some claim that the advanced state of decomposition could have gotten in the way of such things, and even more concerning is the fact that one of the medical examiners allegedly wanted his name removed from the initial report for unknown reasons. About a year after Manuel and Miguel were found, their bodies were exhumed and tested once again for toxins. 
With hair tests, they search for arsenic, mercury, barium, and thallium, the results of which are arsenic 0.000041%, mercury, barium, and thallium all at 0.0001%. Experts at the Atomic Energy Institute in Sao Paulo claim that this proves scientifically that the deaths of these men were not caused by any of these specific poisons. Of course, this doesn't necessarily rule out poisoning altogether. One of the most bizarre details in this case is the claim that the grass where the bodies were found had died off and never grew back. I fell into a bit of a rabbit hole trying to figure out if this is normal or not, and it turns out that based on what I could find, the answer is sort of. Obviously, every individual case varies, but in general, it's said that the grass does indeed die off, but after some amount of time, it grows back faster and stronger than before. As for why the grass never grew back where Manuel and Miguel were found, well, some assume it's due to whatever was in their systems when they passed away, but unfortunately, this detail about the grass isn't exactly well documented enough to draw any conclusions. Again, just too many variables and not enough data on the state of the grass over the years following the incident. Still, I did think it was fascinating enough to quickly bring up before we move on to our next section. It goes without saying that due to several factors at play here, the best we can really do is speculate based on the information we have available. This case has way too much going on and not enough concrete facts to actually definitively prove what happened that day on Vintum Hill. If we're to believe official reports, the men had no signs of poisoning whatsoever, but if we consider the fact that they might be wrong for some reason, then that brings up a few new questions. Again, based on all these circumstantial evidence, it doesn't seem like Manuel and Miguel planned to spend their last moments atop the hill, but rather they took the capsules as planned and did not realize what it would do to them. For a lot of people, this is where they close things up and call it good, but this does beg the question. Who gave them the capsules and did they know it would kill these men? Per the notes, the lead masks were worn for protection, presumably against harsh light, but also probably against radiation the men were expecting to be exposed to. It's possible that they were duped into thinking whatever they were taking would help protect them, or maybe even just help heighten their senses to make contact easier. Earlier in this episode, I mentioned a couple of loose factors, mainly the fact that a lot of the men's money had gone missing and the detail about the neatly cut foliage, but those are not the only elements pointing to a possible third person. The first assumption here would be that the third person had to be Gomez, but for one reason or another, police felt comfortable enough with ruling him out. They were too busy following other leads, at one point claiming to be searching for a car that was allegedly used to get the men to the base of Vintum Hill, and in 1968, a suspect described as a blonde man had entered the fold. Said man was said to have been sighted with Manuel and Miguel before their deaths. Technically speaking, even though the actual cause of death was never determined, this case to many is considered solved. That's because in 1969, a report came out regarding one man's shocking confession. Already in prison, serving a lengthy sentence for prior unrelated offenses, it seemed he had nothing to lose when he confessed to a relative that he was behind the infamous lead mask case. Bizani claims that things went down like this. He and some of his colleagues spotted Miguel and Manuel that fateful day in August, and having overheard that they were on their way to buy a car, the group decided that these men were to be their targets. They made themselves appear friendly, offering to drive Miguel and Manuel to Vintum Hill, and this is where things allegedly took a turn for the worse. The pair were forced to trek up to the summit, then they were given no choice but to ingest the poison capsules. The criminals made off with their money, and it's allegedly as simple as that. Now, it goes without saying that there are a number of issues with the story. For one, the boy responsible for finding Miguel and Manuel allegedly saw them sitting atop Vintum Hill on August 17th. At no point was a group of people mentioned, and neither was any sort of confrontation. There's a number of ways that the situation could have played out, but is Bizani trying to claim that he wrote the cryptic notes that were found on the men? It seems unlikely. Now, let's say the note, capsules, everything, were all Miguel and Manuel's like we suspect. Why even bother making them hike all the way up the hill just to force them to take some pills? One could assume that it was not to make a scene, but why did the men have their raincoats on? It seems unlikely that they would have been allowed to put them on while being threatened. All of those details are pretty wishy-washy, but what about the so-called UFO that half the town witnessed? We all know that said UFO was most likely the result of whatever experiment Miguel and Manuel were conducting, and if said experiment was allowed to happen at all, it seems unlikely that Bizani's version of events is accurate. On top of that, they claim to have robbed the men, but if so, why leave behind a chunk of cash rather than taking everything that they had? Then, of course, there's the good old lead mass. At what point did they allow the men to take those out, and for what purpose? 
Now, that of course brings us into the territory of false confessions. Most people believe that a confession means case closed automatically, but this is a long-standing misconception that somehow manages to survive despite what history tells us time and time again. False confessions, for one reason or another, do happen. In the case of Bizani, it might have just been easier to make this up since he was already locked up. So what's his deal? Honestly, no clue. It could have just been the result of boredom or even an attempt at gaining notoriety by taking credit for a high-profile case. Both the media and authorities seemed way too quick to accept this version of events as truth, but the same can't be said for many members of the public. They, understandably, were quite skeptical, the assumption here being that the police wanted to push Bizani's story to take the focus off the potential incompetence that got in the way of a clear answer regarding this case. If you'll recall, some blonde man was considered a suspect at one point, but that lead seems to have evaporated once this confession emerged. There's no way to know for sure what happened to Manuel and Miguel, or the circumstances surrounding their deaths, but in my personal opinion, these men most likely did make their way up Ventum Hill by choice, and did follow the instructions that were found on them. An experiment seemed to have taken place, but were these men taken advantage of, or even deliberately taken out by whoever supplied them with the capsules? If so, why? The money, although not a massive amount, could potentially be a motive, but to know for sure, the investigation would have had to lean more heavily on people that knew the pair rather than some shady group of randoms like we're supposed to believe. Based on the autopsy issue, it does seem that there was most likely negligence somewhere down the line, and since it's maybe the most important step of this whole thing, said negligence seems to have barred us from any concrete answers. Regardless, the story of Miguel and Manuel is fascinating, even if it's just about two friends who wanted to talk to spirits on Mars. For now, though, all we can do is wonder. As unsettling as it may seem, people disappearing without a trace isn't all that uncommon, even in the Western world. What sets this particular story apart isn't that a child went missing, but rather the nature of her disappearance and the events that followed. Events that have left the public and law enforcement alike scratching their heads for decades. We're talking, of course, about the apparent kidnapping of Antonette Cayadito, a nine-year-old girl from Gallup, New Mexico, who's said to have been snatched from her home in the middle of the night while her mother slept. It's a case both mainstream media and true crime enthusiasts have consistently returned to over the years. However, in spite of, or perhaps because of, this level of attention, Antonette's disappearance has consistently fallen prey to misinformation, lackluster research, and a miasma of baseless claims. Here, we'll attempt to clear up some of that confusion and give you the most comprehensive look at this case to date. No matter the source, the story begins on April 6, 1986. Antoinette and her two younger sisters, eight-year-old Sadie and five-year-old Wendy, were, according to their mother Penny, left in the care of a babysitter while she was having a night out with her friends. While this is by no means conclusive evidence to the contrary, it is worth noting that, at this point, nowhere could we find this babysitter named or a version of events from the babysitter's perspective. It bears mentioning because, following the night's events, both Antoinette's parents and her siblings would repeatedly emphasize her level of maturity for her age and paint a picture of a child routinely taking on the role of an adult caregiver. Regardless, in Penny's account, she says she arrived back at 204 Arnold Street around midnight, at which point her three daughters were asleep. She dismissed the babysitter and proceeded to talk with a now-awake Antoinette until roughly 3 a.m. And this is where the narrative really starts to splinter. In an attempt to make things as clear as possible, we're going to start with the version of events often parroted but rarely questioned. This is what you'll find on Wikipedia, along with a myriad of news articles and blog posts. This account comes from the youngest of the three sisters, then a five-year-old Wendy Montoya. According to Wendy, sometime after 3 a.m., they noticed a knock on the door and a voice of a male claiming to be Uncle Joe. Antoinette would be the one to answer, and when she did, two men grabbed her. They carried her kicking and screaming into a brown van, threw her inside, and, as we all know, she was never seen again. Now, what people often miss here is that this version of events hadn't come to light immediately following Antoinette's disappearance, and only actually surfaced five years later when Wendy, now age 10, was approached by the FBI and asked if she remembered anything about that night. She explained to investigators that she couldn't see the faces of either kidnapper, and that she hadn't brought up what she'd seen sooner because she wrongfully assumed that she'd somehow get in trouble. 
An aspect that does not seem to be in dispute is that the girl's mother only realized that Antoinette was missing later that morning when she woke to get her kids ready for Bible school. We'll cover this more in detail shortly, but for Wendy's revised story to be believed, we also have to believe that she witnessed two grown men snatch her sister and then chose to go back to bed without telling anyone, which, while possible for a child who may not grasp the severity of the situation, is certainly worth questioning. It's also worth considering the child's age at the time of the kidnapping, how removed this retelling was, and that she'd later go on to say, quote, I really don't want to say I remember everything about Antoinette. I don't. I just go off pictures and off stories I was told as the years go by. I really don't remember her. It hurts me. 30 years is a long time not to know who your sister was. While none of this means that her story is untrue, we do feel there's too much uncertainty here to consider this absolutely definitive. The second version of events comes from the middle sister Sadie by way of Antoinette's father, Larry Estrada. According to the girl, sometime after 3am, she and Antoinette had heard someone at the front door, but because neither of them recognized the man, they decided not to respond and instead went back to bed. An unspecified amount of time later, another knock could be heard. Antoinette got up to see who it was, while Sadie stayed in bed and went back to sleep once more, completely oblivious to what was about to happen to her sister. Sadie would tell investigators that she couldn't describe the first man at the door, and that she didn't see who was there the second time. Notably, she didn't seem to mention her sister Wendy at all, although it is possible that the youngest of the girls followed Antoinette, and that Sadie didn't realize given the fact that she stayed put and went back to sleep. Now, adding even more fuel to this already unwieldy fire is a news article from the Albuquerque Journal published on December 13th, 1987, which mentions Sunita, presumably Sadie, having recalled hearing a man and woman's voice after the second knock, who allegedly identified themselves as an aunt and uncle. Apparently, they had asked, hurry, we're cold out here, open the door. Another source from the time would simply say that the girls had heard someone at the door and that Antoinette alone had gone to see who it was and simply never returned. No matter whose account we're looking at, though, it's important to remember that we're dealing with very young children who, regardless of the exact nature of what went down, experience the trauma of losing a sibling at a time in their lives where such a thing was going to be especially hard for them to process. As if the situation wasn't difficult enough to unravel, the two sisters have seemingly been estranged for decades at this point, and so far as we can tell, have actually not discussed the night in question as adults in order to clear up any potential discrepancies in what each of them remembers. Now, when we hear something like this, it's easy to let imaginations run wild and assume that it alludes to some kind of disagreement related to the disappearance. What we can confirm, however, and thanks to her openness about it, is that Wendy Montoya did struggle with addiction throughout her teenage years and into adulthood. While she thankfully seemed to have conquered her demons later on in life, it's fair to say that relationships have broken down over things far more trivial than addiction, so their parting ways might have been sparked by any number of things rather than anything more conspiratorial. Whatever the truth of that night happens to be, what we do know is that when the girl's mother awoke sometime around 7am that morning, Antoinette was nowhere to be found. While many sources say that Penny Cayadito called the police immediately, Penny herself told Unsolved Mysteries in 1992 that she didn't panic right away. Instead, she first checked around the house and asked around the neighborhood to see if anyone knew where Antoinette was. After hours of searching, at around 11 a.m., Penny gave in and finally called 911, where she was promptly told by police that she'd have to wait another eight hours before filling out a missing persons report. The police began their search the following day, a point that, of course, frustrated Penny while law enforcement claimed that it made no difference due to there being no evidence to find. While there was, in fact, no concrete evidence, there were some potential clues related to the state of the scene. For instance, Penny Cayadito found both the front door and screen door unlocked that morning. The screen door is of particular relevance because, in the words of Antoinette's father, quote, Antoinette wouldn't have opened the door for someone she didn't know, and the screen door meant that she'd have been able to see whoever it was outside before allowing them access. While there were no signs of a struggle, the screen door, in combination with the fact that Antoinette's pink nightgown was missing, but all of her other coats and shoes were accounted for, led both parents to conclude that the girl likely hadn't left by choice, but had been familiar with whoever had taken her. 
Also worth mentioning from that morning is an older model brown truck with New Mexico plates seen outside of the Cayadito residence by an elderly neighbor. This neighbor said she saw the truck between 6.30 and 7.30 a.m. and witnessed a man getting out and approaching the household, but did not pay enough mind to notice any distinguishing features. Her time frame straddles the time Penny Cayadito says she woke up, though Penny never mentioned seeing the truck herself, and both she and Estrada told press that they didn't know anyone who drives a vehicle of that description. Though it's tempting to connect this sighting to the brown van later mentioned by Wendy Montoya, the timing of both accounts don't appear to sync up based on the information we have from those who were there. From here on, the search for Antoinette went cold for about a year. That is, until the Gallup police received this disturbing phone call. I'm Antoinette Cayadito. I'm Antoinette Cayadito. Okay, whereabouts in Albuquerque? You said you could use a phone. Hello? Antoinette, where are you? Antoinette? Now, while it's possible the call was nothing more than a cruel hoax, Penny Cayadito didn't seem to think so, having said, quote, it was her voice. I would know my baby's voice anywhere. She'd also say, I don't think they mean to harm her. I think they just don't know how to give her back without getting in trouble. Which is a pretty strange conclusion to reach about your daughter's kidnappers. At this time, Gallup police detective Amos Hinshaw would express his doubts in relation to Antoinette's family. Quote, My gut feeling is that some of the family members may not be telling us all that they know. He felt this way because the police hadn't known for some time that a number of people had been in and out of the Kaidito home prior to Antoinette's disappearance. On top of this, law enforcement had independently gathered information that was later confirmed by the family, much of which the family could have just given them up front in order to aid the investigation. This echoed the belief of some of the public, who seemed convinced that the family knew more than they were leading on. The phone call, though it was reported on right away, wasn't actually released to the public until January of 1989, at which point it was broadcast on the radio. Investigators held off on doing so for a while because they feared that, should they make it clear to the girl's captors that it was the police she'd called, they might be putting the child at risk. They chose to release the call in the end, both because of how much time had passed since they'd received it, and because the case was at a complete standstill. Doing so did renew interest, but sadly did not lead to any significant progress. Later that same year, another twist was in store. One that to this day seems to have been misinterpreted and misrepresented, in a way potentially detrimental to the case. On September 5th, 1989, Antoinette's intellectually disabled aunt, Luisa Estrada, also disappeared. She'd set out on an evening walk, something she did often, and failed to return. Unbeknownst to her parents at the time, 25-year-old Luisa had begun to frequent bars and go to dances during this time frame, something that, while entirely legal, wasn't ideal given her vulnerability. According to her mother and father, her mind was equivalent to that of a 5-7-year-old. to seven year old. She was also born with a cleft palate, and had a speech impediment that made her hard to understand. She would scream and cry if she was away from home for too long, which made her parents concerned that she might be difficult for a captor to handle, which might lead to her harm. Reports from the same time stated that she was last seen in a park outside a Catholic church on the north side of Gallup on either September 5th with a man in his late 20s, or on September 6th with a 40-50 to 50 year old man. If you read practically anything about Antoinette's case today, you'd be forgiven for thinking that this was the end of her Aunt Louisa, however, that appears to not be the case at all. According to this October 1989 article from the Albuquerque Journal, which seems to have been overlooked for the past several decades, Luisa Estrada was actually found alive in Juarez, Mexico, a month after she went missing. She was first spotted by a family friend who happened to be in Juarez, although this friend wasn't aware that she was missing at the time. When the fact came to their attention, they informed Luisa's father, Modesto Estrada, who went to Mexico and spoke to Juarez police who, quote, did in an hour and a half what the Gallup police couldn't do in a month. When the woman was found, she reportedly was dirty, disheveled, and had an infected cut on her leg. It turns out that Juarez authorities had picked up Luisa two weeks prior to her being reunited with her family, but they too weren't aware that she was considered missing and thus released her at the border. Luisa's story is an important piece of the puzzle, because many who were of the understanding that she was never found have theorized that her disappearance in Antoinette's might have somehow been connected, when in reality that does not appear to be the case at all. 
According to Louisa herself, she was kidnapped by a man in Gallup, had her ankles and wrists bound, and was taken to Mexico by car. Don't tell your daddy, her captors allegedly instructed. Based on what we now know, it seems far more likely that an opportunist simply snatched a vulnerable woman and that the two cases are unrelated. Now, we've already covered a lot, but there's still one more strange occurrence we need to discuss before we can wrap up here. In Nevada in 1991, a Carson City waitress reported seeing a girl in her early teens who matched Antonette's description dining with a quote, unkempt couple. The waitress would tell investigators that this girl kept dropping her fork, and every time she'd retrieve it for her, the girl would squeeze her hand. According to the waitress, once the group left, she uncovered a note written on a napkin beneath the teen's plate that read, quote, help me, call police. Unfortunately, this sighting also went nowhere, but in 1992, this, along with other crucial moments of Antonette's disappearance, would be reenacted on the episode of Unsolved Mysteries, where Wendy Montoya's revised version of events was brought to the attention of the public. The segment also featured Penny Cayadito, who did an on-camera interview for the piece. While the show led to yet more attention, it did not lead to any tangible progress, and to this day, we still don't know what happened to Antoinette. Based on everything we've talked about then, what exactly are the possibilities? First off, Antoinette actually does have an Uncle Joe, though according to the FBI, he had an alibi and a witness to corroborate it, and so is not considered a suspect. Detective Corporal Marty Escabel of the Gallup, New Mexico Police Department stated that he believed the kidnappers were not direct family members, but were close enough to the family to know who Uncle Joe was. Escabel also said publicly that he believes the kidnappers in a brown van a version of events to be accurate. Given this, we might have to start looking inward. What of Antoinette's parents? Plenty of outlets seem to be confused about who Antoinette's father even is, mistakenly saying that it's Anthony Montoya. This is incorrect according to contemporary sources, and doesn't make much sense today either, given Antoinette had a different dad to her younger sisters, and her youngest sister Wendy still shares a surname with Montoya. While he's certainly worth considering in his own right, he's not the missing girl's father, and there's very little information to go on regarding him. There are, however, rumors that the actual father, Larry Estrada, had some sort of link to criminals, and that this might mean that he was involved in his daughter's disappearance. While this may or may not be true, he did at least allude to knowing criminals, though in the context of trying to find Antoinette. Quote, I've got street people that aren't very friendly with the law. I figure I can get more information from the streets right now. Maybe they can bring something to me. The word's out. In the same article this is quoted from, Estrada also mentioned that he was considering taking out a loan to hire a private investigator, so while we can't rule out his involvement, this may indicate that his statement had less to do with being involved and more to do with his lack of faith in police. As for Penny Cayadito, many of the rumors and theories surrounding the disappearance seem to revolve around her, but unfortunately most of what's said about her appears to be pure speculation. Hearsay states that she had strangers in and out of the house routinely, and the idea that she sold Antoinette to traffickers has come about seemingly as the result of someone on a forum believing she had bought a new car shortly after her daughter disappeared, which we've found no evidence of at all. Often mentioned too is a quote, failed lie detector test she allegedly took, although whether she failed or it was inconclusive seems to depend on who you're talking to, and any source mentioning it seems to be from decades after the fact, and never backs up this claim with any sort of evidence. If this lie detector test did happen, then what questions did she fail on? Lying about how much she'd had to drink would be quite different from lying about knowing where her daughter is, after all. Plus, if these failed questions were related to her daughter's whereabouts, then why didn't investigators seem to believe that she was involved? According to Newsbreak, the FBI named Penny Cayadito a suspect in 2016, though predictably they didn't cite a source for this and no other outlet seems to corroborate it. Either way, naming her a suspect wouldn't have done much anyway, since Penny Cayadito actually died in 1999. Was she involved? We'll probably never know, though there's certainly no solid evidence that she was, from what we can tell. While it seems likely that Antoinette knew her kidnappers to some extent, the size of Cayadito's extended family made it hard to look into them at all, and the friends of her mother only made the list of potential suspects even longer. Though the phone call and the sighting in Carson City seems to indicate Antoinette was kept alive for an extended period of time by those who took her, police now believe that she's most likely dead. Her case remains open.
most of you have likely at least heard of the Stop Asian Hate movement, especially considering its reach, which seemed to have peaked just last year. It seems now that the wider public has stopped talking about the issue, but just because the hashtags have dwindled down doesn't mean the problem has subsided. I remember a lot of venom when this movement was in the spotlight. People saying that it wasn't even a thing that was happening, or trying to use it as a way to pit one group against another. But not only is this a thing that's happening now, it's far from the first in this country's history. This latest surge was of course sparked by the COVID-19 pandemic, and fueled even further by political figures along with tired stereotypes like the model minority myth. For many, it's completely okay to be an asshole to those of Asian descent, and if you dare call them out for it, they'll just call you a whiny snowflake because to them, none of this is happening now and never has in the past either. Tonight, I'd like to tell you about the story of a man named Vincent Chin, one that eerily echoes much of what we're seeing today. On June 19th of 1982, 23-year-old Vincent Chin and three of his friends were drinking at the Fancy Pants Lounge, a nightclub on Woodward Avenue in Highland Park, Michigan. The get-together was a bachelor party for Chin himself. He was due to be married the following week, so naturally, when things kicked off, spirits were high. Also present in the lounge that night were one, Ronald Evans, and his stepson, Michael Nitzel. The pair were paying close attention to the revelries, and at some point during the evening, Evans would witness Chin generously tipping a dancer, and this was enough to, quote, enrage him, according to witnesses. He'd begin hurling racist remarks, barking orders at the dancers, demanding that they not accept anything from Chin's party. In response, Vincent left his seat to confront his harassers, and from there, the situation escalated. The two men would continue their torrent of verbal abuse towards Vincent and one of his friends, Jimmy Choi. In retaliation, Chin physically attacked Evans, and in response, Evans would attempt to use a chair as a weapon. One broken chair and some staff intervention later, all those involved had been kicked out. So the obvious question at this point is, why would Evans be so offended by a man that he didn't even know tipping a nightclub dancer? Well, the dancers themselves would later shed some light on this. According to them, Evans and Nitzel blamed Vincent Chin and Jimmy Choi for recent layoffs in the automotive industry. For a significant period of time, the trade was the backbone of Michigan's economy, but had recently taken a severe downturn, the consequences of which are still evident to this day. Ronald Evans himself was employed by Chrysler as a plant supervisor, and his son, Nitzel, had recently been let go by the same company and since found employment at a furniture store. The dancers would quote the pair as saying the following, You guys are the reason we're laid off. Because of little motherfuckers like you, a lot of Americans are losing their jobs. As it turns out, the catalyst here was the typical they're taking our jobs kind of excuse. But as is usually the case, their rage was born of ignorance and, above all, sheer stupidity. In the late 70s, the US automotive industry did indeed hit hard times, through a combination of factors both in and out of its control. The costs of oil and healthcare were rising, and this increased cost of doing business spelt trouble for the so-called Big Three, General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler. The jump in outgoings led these mammoth companies to downsize their plants. A series of poor business decisions on the part of the corporations themselves would also exacerbate their issues. What made things even worse was the stiff competition that had gained a foothold in the US market. Brands from Europe, such as Volkswagen, Renault, and Fiat, and those from Asia, such as Toyota, Subaru, Honda, and Nissan, had grown in popularity by offering better fuel economy and including standard features that were typically additional extras in American-made cars. These would be things like radio, electric windows, AC, and even central locking. Now, to put it bluntly, the overseas competition was making better vehicles and offering customers more for less. And even with this very rudimentary explanation, it's clear to see that the downturn for Michigan's car industry was not as simple as they're taking our jobs. Rather, it was the result of unforeseen economic issues, questionable business practices, and good old-fashioned free market working as intended. What makes the rest of the night's events even harder to stomach is that not only were the perpetrators absolutely clueless about the industry they claimed to supposedly be so protective of, but they were also clueless when it came to geography. Anyone who is somewhat familiar with cars will recognize that the Asian manufacturers we mentioned earlier are all based in Japan, and as far as Asian countries go, it was Japan who had staked its claim in a sizable piece of the American car market at the time. Vincent was of Chinese descent, an orphan who had moved to the US with his adoptive parents, Bing and Lily Chin. Of course, this means that the man, Evans and Nitzel, were so intent on making their scapegoat, had zero ties to the nation they were convinced wronged them. 
It would soon become clear, however, that the perpetrators were out for blood, and so long as their target was East Asian looking, the details were irrelevant. Though both parties were removed by lounge employees, the argument spilled out into the parking lot and escalated even further. Ronald Evans was quick to retrieve a baseball bat from his car, at which point Vincent and his friends fled the scene. As it turns out, however, this wasn't a satisfying enough conclusion for the two men. Around half an hour later, having paid a third man named James Perry $20 to help them find, quote, the Chinamen, Evans and Nitzel caught up with Chin's group. According to childhood friend Gary Koivu, after the pair had tracked their party down, they cornered Vincent, and that's when Evans struck his leg with the aforementioned baseball bat, effectively incapacitating him. Nitzel aided by holding Vincent down while his stepfather dealt several blows to his head and torso. Vincent would speak before losing consciousness. He said, It's not fair. These would turn out to be his final words. Customers inside a nearby McDonald's, including two off-duty police officers, witnessed the attack. The officers rushed outside to intervene, though the damage was already done. I didn't mean to hurt him that bad, Evans would tell authorities. He and Nitzel were arrested on the spot and taken to Highland Park Police Station, but were later released without charge. In the meantime, Chin was rushed to a hospital to receive treatment, but soon slipped into a coma and would ultimately pass away four days later. On June 27, 1982, the day that was supposed to be Vincent's wedding, his family and friends instead attended his funeral. As if this wasn't bad enough, this would actually not be the end of their heartache. In April of the following year, Ronald Evans and Michael Nitzel were finally charged with second-degree murder, but via a successful plea, the charge was later reduced to manslaughter. Charles Kaufman, the judge who presided over the case, would sentence the killers to three years probation and a $3,000 fine each. He delivered the verdict without notifying Chin's attorneys, effectively ensuring neither murder would ever serve prison time. Kaufman would then attempt to justify this ridiculous decision by saying, quote, I just didn't think that putting them in prison would do any good for them or for society. You don't make the punishment fit the crime. You make the punishment fit the criminal. This was a cowardly, though still transparent, way of admitting to the world that he didn't actually see any value in Vincent Chin as a human being, and one can't help but wonder what the outcome here would have been had the roles been reversed for everyone involved. As you'd hope, this turn of events outraged the public, who understood the absurdity of the, as some called it, $3,000 license to kill ruling. Mass demonstrations took place, and participants demanded further action be taken against Vincent's killers. In 1984, as a response to the outcry, the U.S. District Court sentenced Ronald Evans to 25 years in prison for violating Chin's civil rights. Unfortunately, and maybe even predictably, this was short-lived, as the sentence was later thrown out on appeal and a retrial ordered. The retrial took place in Cincinnati, Ohio, home to a community with next to no Asian Americans among them. In 87, the second trial ended with an acquittal for Evans, but this didn't mean the fight was over. Later that same year, a civil suit for the unlawful death of Vincent was settled out of court. Michael Nitzel was ordered to pay 50000 over the course of 10 years, and Ronald Evans was ordered to pay over $4 million. According to Helen Zia, who represents the Chin Estate, these payments were never made. Zia and the Chin Estate would go on to sue Evans in 2015 for failing to pay what was due, which increased the amount owed to $8 million. From what we could find, it's unclear whether or not Evans is still refusing to comply, though feel free to make an educated guess on that topic based on his track record thus far. Frustratingly, justice was not served in this case, and the tragedy was never treated with the gravity it deserved by any authority, even after repeated, lengthy legal proceedings. Even decades later, certain public figures would attempt to deflect or downplay the crime, and most notably this happened with Congressman John Conyers. During a 1998 hearing, Conyers would refer to the case, stating, quote, The problem was, it was political, it was not racial. It was about the automobile industry. This was a Japanese-American, and they were thinking about imports and exports. Not only would he neglect to mention the killers had paid a man for help finding, quote, the Chinamen, which undercuts his point entirely, but he'd offer his patentedly false interpretation of their motive while wrongfully stating that Shin was Japanese-American. 
There's a lot that's disheartening about this story, but that doesn't mean Vincent's legacy isn't a meaningful one, or that the work of those who took to the streets to express their outrage was in vain. Chin's death revitalized a movement of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders who made their stand against racism during a period of tension between themselves and the white community, mostly due to post-World War II friction and the aforementioned economic rivalry between the US and Japan. They chose to face a potentially hostile response, rather than let this miscarriage of justice fade into memory, and this led to the first civil rights trial in history for an Asian American. According to Rene Tajima Peñal, a professor of American studies at UCLA and co-director of the documentary Who Killed Vincent Chin, prior to the backlash, Asian Americans were not seen as a protected class, which puts into perspective how important a step this was. A year after the murder, the Asian Pacific American Legal Center was formed, the predecessor to another organization, Asian Americans Advancing Justice, who to this day are focused on ensuring that what happened to Vincent Chin does not happen again. In 2010, a plaque was raised in Ferndale, Michigan to honor the memory of Vincent Chin. Of course, this is far too little, much too late, but if nothing else, perhaps it can serve as a reminder to us all that the cost of bigotry is steep. Now, my whole motivation behind making this video, and I'm I'm now off script, by the way, comes from a lot of hurt and, and, and heartache, I guess, about what has been going on lately. And what's even worse about it is the fact that a lot of people just don't care. Again, we had a moment where people seemed to care, um, and people were talking about it a little bit more, but... By and large, right, and and I'm not talking about, you know, the people who supported the Stop Asian Hate movement or whatever. I, I appreciate everyone who spoke up about that, you know, especially those of you who are not Asian, for example. Um, but, but being an Asian person myself, I mean, I, I, I've seen this, I've seen this before. You know, attitudes towards us tend to be that of, oh, you're privileged. Oh, you're just white. You're not even a minority. And honestly, there's not really anywhere to go from there. There's not really a place for us to be able to talk about what's going on with us. And for the most part, we like to stay silent. When coronavirus first broke out, and we're talking like right at the beginning of 2020, stuff like this started to happen. You know, uh, I follow a lot of Asian pages personally, again, because I'm Asian. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I, I saw things happening, you know, whether it just be insults or you know, people writing go back to China on people's cars or, you know, even down to full-blown assault or whatever else, Karen's being like, you know, speak English, blah, blah, blah. That stuff started to happen in 2020, but we did not feel, I and mean, I don't want to speak for everyone here, but I got the impression that Asian Americans at the time did not feel as though we could speak out. And a lot of that comes from our culture. A lot of that comes from not wanting to shake the boat, so to speak. And thinking that perhaps, and maybe in an internalized way, thinking that, hey, you know, we might have these issues, but it's not as bad as other people's issues. And many, in many ways, we could argue that that's true. But at some point, something has to be said. And again, I'm glad that eventually this all came out. I'm not sure if the last movement will do anything. Um, and I guess for me, I'd been really, <laughs> okay. I know people are gonna are gonna dog on me for this in the comments, but do whatever the fuck you want. I had been depressed about this for a long time. I'd been depressed about it again since the start of Corona, when when I saw all of these attitudes coming out towards Asian Americans, not even just Chinese Americans, anyone who looked Asian enough, East Asian specifically. But let's not get into that. You know, Asians are not a monolith and all that. But I, for a long time, did not know what to do about it, and I still don't know what to do about it. Um, but the only thing that I want to say, and maybe the point in making this video, is that. We have a long history of dealing with stuff like this in this country. It's not new. It's not because of coronavirus. I saw people saying that like, oh, you Asians are just trying to, you know, get on that, you know, oppression Olympics, or you're just trying to earn woke points right now because it's trendy to, to protest and whatnot. And I'm like, look, we had, we had the Chinese Exclusion Act. We had, uh, like race massacres happen on the on the west coast yeah a lot of people don't talk about that you know for for me personally um i'm part japanese american you know my my end of things we were put into camps in world war ii and to this day i still people i still see people justifying that as well you know we didn't know which one you were or you know we didn't know like which one of of you japanese folks might have been a spy or whatever i mean these are people who are immigrants in america right? And their children. So these are Japanese Americans, American citizens that they also put in the camps. 
every time something happens in this country, and I don't mean every time, every time something happens in this country that has to do with some Asian country, despite the fact that like a lot of us were born in America, obviously, and a lot of us don't even speak the, the, the language of our, our motherland, so to speak, we are always linked to that place whatever it may be, and we are seen as responsible. Shit, we're even seen as responsible for, for stuff other Asian countries have done that have nothing to do with us. You know, like in the case of Vincent Chin. Back then, people were a lot of people were mad at Japanese folks. And it didn't it didn't matter. They didn't they didn't know what you were, you know? To to them you just you just look slanty eyed. You must be Japanese or Chinese, whatever. It's the same thing to them. And and nowadays, you know, people are are angry at, at Chinese folks because, you know, China virus, blah blah blah. And you know, you see the opposite thing happening, where like a Japanese person, for example, could be attacked because people just think that they're Chinese. Again, my my whole point in making this video was just to say that this has been happening for a long time. This is not new. Um, the stuff, the examples that I mentioned, are far from the only times that something like this has happened. Um, and that that's specifically just talking about East Asian um, experiences here. Um, you know, if you want to talk about you know other other parts, I mean, there's there's even the the rise in hate crimes against, you know, Muslims, for example, or anyone who was basically brown enough after 9-11 to be mistaken as a Muslim. Uh, I know Indian folks, for example, got attacked for that. Lots of Muslim folks. It does not make any sense. Okay, so I'm back a few minutes later. Not that any of you can tell that there was a time jump, but this is a little bit in the future. And I just wanted to come back to talk about things you could do because if you're listening this far in, I'm going to assume that you at least somewhat care. And you might ask me what you can do about this. Again, I, I don't even know what to do about it, but what I will say is probably just research. Learn about the history, not, not just of Asian Americans, but of any minority group, any oppressed group in this country. Obviously BLM. Uh, learn about what indigenous folks have gone through, whether that be the Native Americans or... Um, as someone from Hawaii, I'm really gonna recommend that you look into how Hawaii became a state and the stuff that Native Hawaiians are worried about. The list can obviously go on and on. And again, I know that people will argue that, oh, you just hate America, you don't care, you know, you just want to focus on the bad things and, and blah blah fucking blah. I would argue that technically speaking, we're the ones who want to actually learn the proper history. And that doesn't mean that we have to discount all the good things that have happened here. But what good is it going to be for anyone if we start omitting history? As an Asian American, this was not taught to me in school. And I'm from, again, I'm from Hawaii, which I think might be the only state that has an Asian majority, and, and, and I was not taught in school about all of these, these things that had happened um, in Asian American history. I mean, if, if it's that bad, I mean, I'm sure for everyone else, every other person who happens to be non-white who has not had their history taught to them, or their history taught to them in, in a light that frames them as something worth a shit, uh, we hold a lot of internalized ideas, even against our own people. So yeah, again, definitely just educate yourself. That's all I can say. It's a story all too familiar while still being almost too awful to imagine. A family out for a walk in broad daylight looks away for just a moment, and in a matter of seconds, their child disappears. Years of media coverage, alleged sightings, hoaxes, and even wild theories ultimately amount to nothing, and to this day, a family remains shattered. Tonight we discuss the disappearance of Shinya Matsuoka. In March of 1989, Shinya Matsuoka was just four years old and resided in Ibaraki Prefecture with his mom, dad, older sister, and younger brother. Amidst the otherwise beautiful Japanese springtime, the Matsuokas received news that was both sudden and heartbreaking. Shinya's maternal grandmother had passed away, and for the young family, this meant packing up immediately and making the journey all the way to a city called Komatsushima in Tokushima Prefecture. Funeral arrangements were to be set in motion the very next day. Following the service, in Komatsushima, the family would retreat to a relative's house about an hour away in a small town called Saramitsu. Said home was nestled amongst a rural community flanked by mountainous terrain and a river that stretched for miles. 
Now, in spite of recent events, the Matsuokas held their heads up high. It was now March 7th, and the family got up bright and early to take a stroll around town. Mom decided to stay back while Dad, along with the three Matsuoka children and a couple of their cousins, set out on their walk. All in all, this walk was fairly brief, only lasting about 10 or so minutes, which was just not enough for young Shinya, who wanted to keep going. According to the boy's father, upon returning, the pack made their way up the stairs that led to the family home. He carried the youngest sibling in his arms, while the rest of the kids followed. Shinya was a bit behind, but not by much. Once at the summit, the father looked behind him, noted that Shinya had made it to the top, then quickly headed inside to hand off the baby to his wife. As you can imagine, this took no time at all, just enough to walk down a hallway and back. When Shinya's father turned around, he noticed the boy hadn't followed him inside, and upon making it to the doorway, he saw… nothing. Shinya was gone, vanished, nowhere to be seen. Of course, the first assumption here would be that the boy strayed away somewhere on property. After all, according to the family, eyes were only off of the child anywhere from 20 to 40 seconds. Wherever Shinya was, logic would lead us to believe that it was impossible for him to have gone very far. Now, of course, if Shinya had been found in the moments following this, then we obviously would not be sitting here talking about this right now. The family searched, but to no avail. Soon, the authorities would be involved, and hundreds would search the town and surrounding wilderness, but in the end, Shinya was simply gone. With cases like this, the details of the situation are immediately and rightfully drawn into scrutiny, so here are the considerations for the case of Shinya's disappearance. To start off, we need to paint a better picture of the area in which this all took place. The town of Saramitsu actually does not exist on paper in the modern day. This is because in the mid-2000s, it merged with nearby towns. Now that said though, just before the merger, Saramitsu was said to have roughly 5,700 residents, all living within about 17 square miles. For reference, Manhattan is slightly bigger, 23 square miles, but is home to approximately 1.6 million people. The takeaway here that I'm trying to illustrate is that while this was a rural community engulfed by vast wilderness, the Matsuokas weren't completely isolated themselves and did still have neighbors, none of which were apparently aware that the family would be staying at the home when they did. This is also backed up by some archival images of the area from 1991. As you can see, there is a lot of uncharted territory, but still enough civilization for it to be significant. This info comes as sort of a double-edged blade. While it does open up the possibility of Shinya having been taken, there is also the fact that this was such a small town that anyone who did so might have a hard time getting away with it. No one in the town saw Shinya following this incident, at least not that anyone knows of. Immediately following Shinya's disappearance, the family set up a recording device on their home phone. This, as it turns out, would lead to one of the standout moments of this investigation. Whether or not it actually means anything is up for debate, but nonetheless, it cannot be ignored. Masanobu Matsuoka, Shinya's dad, had received a call from a woman, one who sounded a lot like a Tokushima local based on her accent. The woman wanted to speak to the mother of the household, so that's when Keiko Matsuoka took over. The mysterious woman began explaining that she was the mother of Mariko Nakahara, a student from Seiki Kindergarten. Now, Keiko actually recognized the school because it was the place that Shinya's older sister attended back home in Ibaraki. Mrs. Nakahara continued, explaining that she'd heard about what happened and started a fund to help the Matsuokas out. She wanted to know where to send the money and if the family would be returning to Ibaraki anytime soon, and in fact they were. The next day, the family finally headed back, tragically, without their son. Sometimes Time went by and Mrs. Nakahara had gone silent. Curious, Keiko decided to contact her child's school to ask if they knew anything about this fund, and here's where things get bizarre. Not only was the school unaware of anything about a fund, but they also said that they didn't even have a student named Mariko Nakahara. This puzzling revelation led the family to reflect on the call, and upon thinking it over, they realized a few unsettling things. Again, Shinya disappeared in Tokushima, which is where the family received the call from Mrs. Nakahara, who, according to Keiko and Masanobu, clearly had a local accent. If she was, in fact, local, then how did she know anything about the Matsuoka's life back in Ibaraki? How would she know what school Shinya's sister attended? Even worse, this person even knew which group Shinya's sister belonged to within said school. On the flip side of this, if this person really was from Ibaraki like they claimed, how did they know what was going on all the way in Tokushima? 
Keep in mind, this is 1989, and only about a week after Shinya had gone missing. News of this case hadn't hit national headlines yet, and it would have been highly unlikely for anyone outside the family's immediate circles to have known their phone number. We'll return to this later on in the video, but Mrs. Nakahara was really the last possible lead in the case at the time. After their return home, Keiko and Masanobu would spring into action by trying to get as much media attention on Shinya as possible. Dozens of TV appearances would follow, along with the Matsuoka's posting their home phone number publicly in order to receive tips. One by one, they started to pour in and continued doing so for years, but ultimately none led to any significant developments. People claimed to have seen Shinya in a nearby city, a department store hundreds of miles away, a park, the subway. None of these tips would help, however, and the case grew cold. The 90s and 2000s came and went, as did the majority of the 2010s, but in 2018, this case would see another bizarre and ultimately upsetting turn. <laughs> Kinkyo Kokairai Sosaku, or roughly translated as Urgent Public Search, is a long running investigative documentary series that airs semi annually on the Japanese TV station TBS. Just to provide some further context, the show isn't exactly the usual docuseries you might be used to seeing out in the West. Instead, it's presented almost like a game show, complete with a set, MC, and a panel of hosts. The show focuses on real-life mysteries concerning missing people, including those who might actually be missing themselves. By that, I mean individuals that either have memory loss or might not know their actual backgrounds for one reason or another. The goal of the show is to bring these people on to tell their stories in the hopes that the signal boost across the country would lead to eventual solutions. In their spring 2018 season, the show featured a young man who went by the pseudonym Ryoto Wada, and his story was almost too too incredible to be believed. Wada wasn't suffering from amnesia. Rather, his particular situation began when he was too young to understand what was even going on. According to him, at the time of his appearance, he was roughly 25 years old and unsure of the whereabouts of his family. Per Wada, his earliest memory dates back to when he was roughly four years old. He recalls some kind of trip with his parents that eventually landed him at the house of an uncle he hadn't met yet. This uncle was described by Wada as being a large man somewhere in his 50s or 60s, and for unknown reasons, this man allegedly never allowed the boy to leave the house, save for a few visits to the dentist. All in all, Wada would claim to have been essentially held captive for a total of 17 years. During this time, he could do nothing but observe his new guardian as he wasn't even allowed to go outside to attend school. This man, whoever he was, would call him Ryoto, and that's the name he adopted. The last name Wada came from the nameplate on their family home. The captor was often present, usually hunched over in front of a computer, seemingly never emerging from the place himself. The assumption the boy made here was that this person was somehow involved in trading stocks. According to Wada, it wouldn't be until 2014 when he'd finally make his escape. After wandering around for some time, he found himself at a department store in Aichi Prefecture, which, just for reference, is at roughly the midway point between Ibaraki, where Shinya was from, and Tokushima, where he had vanished. As soon as Wada appeared on this show, chatter about him possibly being Shinya swept throughout the country. To many, it seemed like a match. In their opinion, his features seemed to line up, his approximate age wasn't all that far off, and his earliest memories could have explained what happened to Shinya. Just as quickly as Wada's story spread, however, it began to fall apart. Before his TV appearance even ended, people began to talk. One Twitter user posted about how Wada was actually an old employee that worked for them at a convenience store, and this information even made its way to the show while it was still live on air. According to the convenience store owner, the man standing in their studio was actually named Hisashi Kitazawa. At the same time this point was being asserted, the internet did what it does best and unearthed evidence of Wada appearing on TV ages before his 2018 stint. In 2012, a man by the name of Takashi Kitazawa appeared both on TV and in an article by the Asahi Shimbun. 
Was the topic memory loss or mystery identities? No. These were about mega fans of an idol group, and in case there was any doubt, clips of Wada slash Kitagawa were archived as well. On top of this, netizens were able to unearth yearbook photos of this person despite him claiming to have never attended school due to being confined. So at this point, we've got four separate names to work with. Wada Ryoto, Takashi Kitazawa, Hisashi Kitazawa, and of course, Shinya Matsuoka. Now, despite where this is all clearly heading, many did have to entertain the possibility that, while convoluted, maybe the situation somehow still added up, especially when we take memory loss into account. Of course, the only way to know for sure would be to do a DNA test, and luckily for everyone following the story, Masanobu was still very much alive and still very much looking for his son. When the story picked up, the now elderly man took to Facebook to issue public statements on the revived investigation into Shinya's disappearance. In the end, it was proven by DNA analysis that Wada slash Kitazawa, or whatever his name really is, was not Shinya. And while no one can say for sure, it's generally accepted that this person faked this whole situation for attention, which of course meant leading a family on and getting their hopes up. Following this, some controversy still fell upon the TBS show that featured the imposter, with many claiming that the show had deliberately staged it for the sake of ratings. While that hasn't been definitely proven, many would point to other seemingly similar instances that would further cast doubt on the show. Again, nothing has been proven, but at this point, at least when it comes to Shinya, it's unfortunately irrelevant. After all this time and all this trouble, we're still no closer to knowing what happened to Shinya, but there are still a few things to consider. The phone call, of course, is obviously something that we just can't ignore. Again, you have the issue of the person having a Tokushima accent, but claiming to be from Ibaraki and also being able to name the school attended by Shinya's sister, and somehow having the phone number of their Tokushima house. I think for many, this could come off as someone close to the family probing for information. After all, it seems that's about the only way all of this info could have been obtained. If this is the case, then why lie? What was the point? Mrs. Nakahara also asked the family when they'd be returning to Ibaraki, so maybe this was all just a way to see if they'd finally be out of the way? There's no way to know for sure, but another theory that many have put forth to explain this phone call is a common scam used all over Japan and even elsewhere for that matter. This is how it's supposed to work. So let's say you've got an elderly person living alone. The scammer cold calls them, claiming to be a relative without actually saying a name, and all they have to do is wait for the victim to offer up the information themselves. Going, hey, it's me, remember me, etc. could then lead grandma to being like, Jimmy, is that you? Then the scammer could go in a number of different directions depending on how things progress. In the case of Mrs. Nakahara, the idea would be that Keiko actually named the kindergarten herself without realizing it, and whoever the caller was just played along. Now, no matter what this call was actually about, it's no doubt bizarre and probably warrants the most attention out of any of the leads to come up in the last few decades. Another popular theory is one that I actually haven't even hinted at yet thus far. It's going to sound a bit out of left field, but bear with me here because it is something that a lot of people at least entertain. One of the earliest alleged sightings of Shinya actually dates back to April of 1989, just weeks after the boy disappeared. The person who claims to have seen Shinya points to Tokushima's coast. There they recall seeing a boy with a man somewhere in his 30s. To them, the man looked rather suspicious, and even more so because upon noticing that someone saw them, the man led the boy to a white car and drove off. As for what this means, many believe it could indicate that Shinya had been abducted and taken to North Korea, which is a thing that happens, but obviously can't be proven in this case. Nonetheless, Shinya is considered by many to be a potential victim of these circumstances. Taking things back for a moment, we also need to be open to the possibility that Shinya did in fact get lost somewhere in town. This consideration is grim, but as many have pointed out, it is possible that the boy may have fallen into some kind of storm drain and was just never found. Such things have happened in the past, and unfortunately, the probability is probably even higher when we're talking about a small child. Whether it be an accident, or someone close to the family, or even the work of an outside entity, the truth of the matter is that even all these decades later, Shinya Matsuoka remains missing. And while the chances are most likely incredibly slim, we can only hope that he's still out there somewhere. This video was written, researched, and edited by yours truly. A massive thank you to you all for watching, and an even bigger thank you to the following people.
Tonight's topic of discussion is an enduring mystery that I actually haven't seen a lot of coverage on so far. Dubbed the impossible murder by those privy to it at the time, this case concerns an unassuming elderly couple in 1930s England and was highly controversial due to its trial. The outcome of said trial led to a first in English legal history, as well as the belief that an innocent man had been spared the gallows or that a cold-blooded criminal had been allowed to walk free. Now, despite the conviction of the court of public opinion, if the facts of this case are to be believed, there's almost no way that this man could have physically committed this act. The year is 1931. The subject, one William Herbert Wallace, age 52. On the surface, Wallace didn't seem very notable. He was an insurance agent at Prudential and lived what most would consider to be a pretty quiet life. His younger days were a bit more colorful, having odd jobs in places like India and Shanghai, before health issues ultimately forced him to return to England. One might argue that this was a blessing in disguise because in 1911, Wallace met Julia, and just two years later, the couple would marry, eventually settling down at 29 Wolverton Street in Liverpool's Anfield District. The Wallaces never had any children, but nonetheless seemed perfectly content. They generally kept to themselves, and despite living at 29 Wolverton for a decade and a half, none of the neighbors ever noticed any sort of tension between the two. In fact, many described them as a seemingly loving couple. Julia, per Wallace, was an excellent pianist and watercolor artist who was also fluent in French and had what he considered to be a very cultured literary taste. Wallace dabbled in science and philosophy and was described as intellectual, albeit a bit fussy and pedantic at times. Still, he did try his hand at the arts, taking up a handful of violin lessons at age 50, presumably so he could attempt to play music with his wife. Together, the couple enjoyed trips to the countryside as well as the occasional night out at the cinema. Of Wallace's many hobbies, however, there was one that stood out from the rest, chess. While his skills as a player are up for debate, there's no denying that the man was enthusiastic. In fact, it was one of the few things that could manage to get Wallace out of the house and away from Julia. As it turns out, however, in a cruel twist of fate, a chess match would mark the beginning of the end for this couple. January 19th, 1931, Monday. The day is now over, and Wallace has just settled in for his match within a local championship competition. Before he could begin, however, he was flagged down by the venue's owner, who'd received a phone call some half an hour before Wallace's arrival. The owner explained that the caller spoke in a strong, gruff voice, and rather than calling back later, preferred for Wallace to meet him at his home the next evening at around 7.30pm. Why? The caller claimed to be a potential client looking to set up insurance for his newly 21-year-old daughter. In fact, the caller claimed that it was his daughter's birthday and that that's actually why he couldn't call back later. He claimed that his name was R.M. Qualtro, which I'll be calling Q from this point forward. His address, 25 Menlove Gardens East, Mossley Hill. Wallace dutifully jotted down all these details, but was very quick to admit that none of it sounded familiar to him in the slightest. He asked around and no one else seemed to recognize the man, nor his address either. The reason for this will become apparent shortly. It's unclear whether or not Wallace won his match, but nonetheless, the night seemed to play out as usual and in no time at all, Wallace was on his way back home. January 20th, 1931, Tuesday. On what appeared to just be another Tuesday, Wallace reportedly worked as he always did, collecting insurance money from clients between the hours of 3.30 and 5.45. According to those who did business with Wallace that afternoon, he seemed quite normal, even cracking jokes and enjoying tea with one of them. Once Wallace was done doing his rounds, he presumably went home. This would have been at about 6 p.m. At this point, it's between 6.30 and 6.45 p.m., which to most might not sound like a big difference, but as we'll soon find out, this minor detail became somewhat of the crux of the entire case. Whichever it was, Julia was still doing fine around this time, going about her day as usual. We know this because this is when a local milk boy stopped by to collect Julia's dues, a business transaction right before the poor woman would meet her untimely end. Meanwhile, bits and pieces of witness chatter would allow us to follow Wallace once more. It's now approximately 7.10 p.m. Wallace is spotted some 20 minutes away from his home, connecting to the next tram line on his journey to find Kew and Menlove Gardens East. Since Wallace was unfamiliar with the area, he made sure to badger everyone and everyone he could for directions. Tram operators, policemen, no one was spared. Now, here's where an interesting issue arose. There indeed was a Menlove Avenue, as well as Menlove Gardens West, South, and North, but no Menlove Gardens East. Some who gave Wallace directions told him this, while others assumed that Menlove Gardens East must be somewhere near the other Menloves, as one would guess. Once Wallace was in the Menlove area, he again asked around some more, but as expected, no luck. 
By 8.20, the search was looking fruitless, and Wallace decided to turn back despite the potential new client. The next update we get comes from Wallace's neighbors at number 31. At around 8.45 p.m., they were getting ready for a night out and about, when they suddenly heard knocking coming from outside. Upon checking, they found a perplexed-looking Wallace, who quickly asked them if they noticed anything strange going on, also pointing out that he tried both the front and back doors with his keys, but they didn't seem to be working. With his neighbors now standing by to assist, Wallace once again tried to gain entry in his back door, and for some reason, this time the key worked. The door popped open, leading to complete darkness. Wallace walked in and started lighting lamps. He went upstairs to check the bedroom, and eventually back downstairs once again. That is when he reached his sitting room, and when he found his wife's lifeless body on the floor just in front of the fireplace. Blunt force injuries to her head made it apparent that Julia was well past the point of being helped. The early investigation didn't exactly do much for this case. In fact, all it did was open up more questions instead of answers. All things considered, the Wallace home wasn't all that disturbed, save for a few things slightly out of place. Blood wasn't found anywhere else aside from the body, not in the bathtub, nor the clothing Wallace himself was wearing that day. There was a cabinet that was broken into along with four pounds said to be missing from a cash box inside, but other than that, there didn't seem to be anything that would indicate a robbery had gone wrong here. There was also an issue of a missing fireplace poker, along with what was described as an iron bar, the latter of which was allegedly found several years later during a renovation of the property. The poker, however, if it was even missing at all, has never been seen since, and to many, it was the most probable weapon in this case, especially considering where Julia's body was positioned. Now, the area surrounding the home had been searched, but the poker was just never found. It goes without saying that in cases like this, you naturally look at every lead that you can manage to dig up. In the case of the Wallaces, there were no substantial tales of infidelity or falling out of love, no obvious third party that might want Julia dead. Again, Julia was quite shy and kept to herself and her husband. It seemed almost unbelievable that someone would want to do her harm, and in such a gruesome way at that. If not a burglary, then what was the point of all this? Of course, it's heavily assumed that whoever Q was, he must have been the killer. His summoning Wallace to Menlove Gardens East was simply to get him out of the way. That is, if Q and Wallace aren't the same person. The court of public opinion had decided from the get-go that this was indeed the case, that Wallace was guilty. To them, only one person could have motive to kill Julia, and this automatically made Wallace the culprit. This attitude was reflected by the jury, who after a four-day long trial took only one hour to sentence Wallace to the gallows. This despite lacking a smoking gun. The judge presiding over the case strongly disagreed with the jury, in fact reminding them of their civil duty to find Wallace not guilty unless they could be sure, based on the evidence, that he had in fact killed Julia Wallace. The judge explained that the question in this particular trial was not who killed Julia, but rather, did Wallace kill Julia? And if so, what was the proof? If another had indeed committed the crime, it would be up to the investigation to find that out. That courtroom, however, was tasked on just one specific person, Wallace, as well as the evidence presented by both the defense and prosecution. Now, whether or not Wallace did kill Julia, I can't say, but I will present the most common points both for and against him. One big point would be the matter of motive. Wallace didn't seem to have one. No quarrels or side lovers, not even an expensive life insurance policy on Julia since she was only insured for a small sum. Wallace would pass away just a couple of years after Julia's death, and in that time, there was no wild change of lifestyle or new wife. Now, could Wallace and Julia have not as been happy as they seemed? Absolutely. There's no telling what goes on behind closed doors, especially when it comes to an almost two-decade-long marriage. But let's say that Wallace did want to kill Julia for some reason. His plan being to stage a call from a fake would-be client, one that everyone at the chess club would hear about. This, along with his Tuesday evening wild goose chase, would be his airtight alibi. The evidence? According to the prosecution, the call from Q was traced to a phone booth a mere 400 yards away from the Wallace household. Had Wallace left his home at about 7.15 that night, he would have reached the phone booth by around 7.18, just in time to make the 7.20 call that the owner of the venue would later answer. After all, this supposed stranger to Wallace somehow knew his schedule well enough to know that he'd be at the chess club. How was that possible? Well, to this, Wallace's defense had a few rebuttals. The venue owner claimed himself that it would be a stretch if Wallace had been the one to call. In his opinion, Q sounded nothing like the man. If we do assume that Q was some third-party criminal, then he could have been watching Wallace leave, having seen him pass the phone booth and taking this as the signal to make his move. Now, why didn't he just kill Julia then? No one knows. 
As for how Q would have known of Wallace's schedule, well, as it turns out, since Wallace was participating in a championship game, his name was actually readily available on the club's roster, which anyone could view. It goes without saying that if Q was someone else, he must have known the Wallaces closely enough to where he didn't want to be recognized, hence leaving a message with the venue owner instead of waiting for Wallace to be present and then calling back, or perhaps leaving a message with Julia, who was obviously home when he made the call to the chess club. Perhaps the most contentious point of this whole case, though, is the matter of whether or not Wallace could have even physically committed the crime, and this comes down to a matter of timing. The milk boy claimed to have seen Julia at 6.30 p.m. The next time we hear from Wallace is at approximately 7.10 p.m. at a location 20 minutes away. This means that at the latest, Wallace would have had to leave his home at 6.50 p.m. in order to make his 7.10 position. With this in mind, Wallace would have had to kill Julia, clean up, not get blood anywhere else in the house, ruffle up the area slightly, all between 6.30 and 6.50, 20 minutes at most. Now, this in and of itself is already a feat. Speed would be one thing, but precision as well. Again, the house was basically spotless as far as blood went, so the idea of someone in that much of a hurry keeping things clean is a stretch. Now, a stretch, yes, but perhaps not impossible. 6.30 p.m. was what the prosecution was banking on, but it wasn't as concrete as they'd hoped. While the milk boy claimed that he picked up Julia's payment at 6.30 p.m., a local paper girl testified that the boy wasn't at Wallace's door at number 29 by the time she left number 27, allegedly around 6.43 p.m. A few neighborhood boys would corroborate this, claiming to have seen the paper girl leaving a few minutes after 6.45. Now, why does this matter? If Julia was actually last seen around 6.45, it makes Wallace's involvement essentially impossible. It would have left him with only about five minutes to murder his wife, clean up, etc., etc. If you recall, Wallace was found by his neighbors outside of his home, claiming that his key didn't work on either door. Once his neighbors were fully present, he once again tried the back door, and lo and behold, it suddenly worked just fine. Now that absolutely sounds suspicious, but the issues here lie in the fact that these doors and locks were never closely examined. The front and back doors are often mentioned here, but there was also supposedly a third door connecting directly to the kitchen. Which one was used at any given time is already unclear, but one thing that could explain all of this is that whichever door Wallace had gained entry with had a rusty lock or handle. According to Wallace, the mechanism was faulty and would sometimes get stuck, and if you've ever had a similar issue, you'll know how much of a pain it can be. But what about the state of the home itself? Sure, a small sum of four pounds had allegedly been taken, but why not more? If this was indeed a robbery, why not take as much as possible? Well, I think it's pretty safe to say that this was never just a robbery, even if a few small things had been taken. Counterpoint though, if Wallace wanted to stage this as a robbery, then the same question applies. Why not make it look more like a robbery? We could go on, but only one truth is apparent right now. This case simply had nowhere to go. No smoking gun for Wallace, and no obvious leads to who might have done this if not him. In the end, Wallace's sentence was overturned due to insufficient evidence, the first time that this was ever done in English legal history. While Wallace was able to walk free per the courts, the same couldn't exactly be said of his personal life. Wallace was still very much guilty in the court of public opinion and was harassed to the point of having to relocate. In just a few short years, Wallace's health issues would catch up to him, and in 1933, he passed away. Following his death, Wallace's private diary entries were made public. Within them, he lamented over the loss of his wife, seemingly remembering her fondly while also expressing suspicion at a colleague from Prudential who he suspected might have been the actual killer. At one point, he wrote about considering sending a private investigator to tail said person, although he never did overtly mention them by name. Depending on where you read, it'll say that Wallace either died due to rejecting a surgery that could have saved his life, Life, or that said surgery failing is what killed him. Either way, the man definitely wasn't living large after Julia passed. Now, if we do assume that Wallace was innocent, then who in the world would have wanted Julia dead and why? The crime itself was particularly gruesome and appeared as though it would have taken a lot of hatred to commit. Still, whoever did this was calculated enough not to leave behind any substantial evidence, assuming that the police didn't somehow mess up their investigation entirely. Almost a hundred years later, and here we are still discussing this, no closer to an answer as those folks in Liverpool all that time ago. There's been a recent spike of long-time unsolved mysteries suddenly getting figured out, and while the truth here seems like it will never see the light of day, we can only hope that it eventually does.